And here they are, right on time. So we have a donation from Samantha's Harvest. And I'd like to invite Mrs. Lisa Gibbs, Mr. Rob Gibbs, and Ms. Samantha Gibbs. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry we were a tad late. We went to the um, superintendent's office oh. first. Sorry. I texted a lot of you, but I guess you didn't get me. So, um, so we're here again for, for probably, I don't know, close to, I would say, the 15th year making a donation to Reading Public Schools, and we are very proud, as always, to do this. Um, our donation is always um, the result of blood, sweat, and tears from a lot of people, a lot of time, and a lot of resources. And um, it is not lost on us that a lot of people here in this room are very much part of that, and we truly have always appreciated your support and the support of Reading Public Schools in what we do. Um, and we love what the district does with our monies, professional development, um, starting programming, um, enhancing programming, and um, this year um, we have been told by the folks at the high school that they would like to have um, $3,000 for um, professional development for staff and also um, enrichment programming for students around inclusion. And as well, we have a $1,375 $1 donation for stipends for the Best Buddies um, advisors. Um, we're very excited that there's a Best Buddies club at the high school now. We've been hoping that this would happen, and we're glad to see it come to fruition and support it. And thank you all for your support and for accepting the donations. Why don't you go feed this to Mrs. Webb? Go that way, Sam. I'm going to come out here. <laughs> Very hard. We'll go right over there. Let's get a good shot. Miss, where's Miss yep. Scott? She's going to take a picture. <laughs> Thank you. All right. She's so afraid. Ready? It's backwards. Oh, Couldn't see the check. Oh, it's in an envelope. <laughs> Yeah, they're in the background. Just look yeah, at me. Mrs. Background? Webb, yeah, look at me. Okay. No, it should be. Thank it's you. fine. Yeah, that's great. I, I like that picture. There we go. Thank you. See, I'm going to shake. See, I'm going to shake. I'll be uh, singing later. <coughs> Thank you so much, Sam. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Did you guys come every year? Sorry, we were a little hard to find tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Sam figured it out. Yeah, good job, Sam. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do. This is Mrs. Engelson is in charge of it, I think, for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I need to make a motion to accept the donation. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that the school committee accept the donation of um, fourteen hundred. Uh, <coughs> sorry, four thousand three hundred and seventy-five dollars for the Best Buddies Club advisors and for professional development for the staff and students at the high school. Yeah, she does Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Thank you so much. So I just want to do a real quick run through the agenda. We will have um, public comment for items not on the agenda. We have our consent agenda. We'll do reports. We have a curriculum update from Assistant Superintendent Christine Kelly and her team. And then for old business, we have a kindergarten update, new business, uh, town meeting warrant technology contract, approving the uh, SEAM collaborative, and then we have uh, two first policy readings. So 
we will go right ahead. Is there any public comment for items not on the agenda? Yes, come forward. Uh, good evening. My name is Ashley Quinn, 131 Beaver Road. Genzani, 84 Whittier Road. We are here tonight as part of Birch Meadow Community, both with three kids in the school system and both have current kindergartners. It, if, this, if this is about the kindergarten, it's on the agenda. So we feel that the following issue has been buried in all of the kindergarten half day, full day events. So we are here tonight speaking during public comment to give this topic its own light. At the January 28th school committee meeting, okay? the preliminary class size numbers for next year were shared. The projections are very troubling for Birch Meadow when looking at numbers and class size for our current kindergarten class as well as the incoming K class. And while much of the discussion centered around concern for the 2021 school year, we feel that next year's first grade class at Birch is getting overlooked and respectfully ask that you expedite possible solutions to accommodate the large class size for next year. We would also like to dig a little deeper into the possibility of adding modular classrooms. We understand that there is a space study that has been approved. However, the space study will not alleviate the class size burden for next year, and it is undetermined how long it will take to complete and unpack those findings. There is a large disparity between class sizes at, our, at other schools versus, versus Birch Meadow. All incoming first grade class sizes for next year are 21 and below except for Birch Meadow. We have one less teacher than schools with similar enrollment. Killam, 75 students, four classrooms, four teachers. Eaton, 74 students, four, four classrooms, four teachers. Birch Meadow, 72 students, three classrooms, three teachers. Due to space, overall, Birch Meadow has one less teacher than a school with similar but lower enrollment. Barrows, 382 students, 19 teachers. Birch Meadow, 386 students, 18 teachers. The recommended class size for K through two is 18 to 22 students. The preliminary projections outline three first grade classrooms of 24 students each. The projection does not include any new students that move into the district. What happens then? Across the board, out of five elementary schools and six grades each, the only classes where you see numbers of 24 are in third and fourth grade at Wood End. We can't speak to what their class sizes were in K and one, K and one but the recommended class size rises in grades three through five as opposed to the 18 to 22 in the K through two. This problem doesn't apply only to our class. The incoming K class is quite large at Birch Meadow as well. And once half day kids return to Birch for first grade, they will be in the same position again for the 2021 school year. We feel that the time is to act now. 24 students in a first grade, first grade class, while their peers experience class sizes of 18 to 21 is just not acceptable. We feel that this is a disadvantage to students and frankly, to teachers. So our questions to you are, why is there so much emphasis being placed on the 2021 school year when enrollment projection for first grade next year are the highest in the school and we're squeezing 24 kids into a classroom? What happens if more kids move into Birch, the Birch District for first grade between now and the start of school, then what? Are you as the administration and or school committee open to considering the means of a modular at Birch for the 1920 school year? It was a process, but done in a relatively short period of time for Josh Wheaton, Barrows, and Killam. Can or will art music rooms be considered as a one-year solution? Less than optimal, but throwing that out there if we need to buy time. And what is the plan if nothing is done? Who's responsible for retroactively accounting for rectifying a deficit that our kids will experience next year if no additional classroom space is made available? The same subset of kids are going to have vastly different learning experiences if next year's Birch Meadow first grade stays as three classes of 24 kids. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I don't know if you're able to address some of the questions no, that we I, have, I, if, you, actually, if we need to plan a meeting with someone, but. I will um, 
I'm actually going to comment because a lot of what you actually brought up is in the memo that um, Dr. Darty uh, prepared talking to the school committee about the limitations um, on the space that we have and mm -hmm. basically even the limitations as we worked and Dr. Darty and his team worked over the last week to um, work hard to achieve full day and half day in the non-integrated model, he highlighted many of these concerns. So it is something that um, is sort of we're looking at these class sizes. Certainly the fact that it's above the guidance is not, not where we want to be for next year. We're talking, we're looking at the 1920, um, school year 1920. So um, I just want to make sure that's what we have in front of us in terms of the enrollment, the school You have the projected that. enrollment for 1920 in the packet. Right. So it is something that we're aware of. Um, I believe I was looking for exactly the um, statement, but I believe Dr. Darty did highlight that if we do have any incoming rise or kindergarten, um, that we will not have available classroom space without um, changing the way we teach our cu current curriculum and program offerings. Mm -hmm. And that sort of speaks to what you mentioned potentially it's about auto music. So mm -hmm. these are absolutely it's all the kinds of things that we've been talking 18. about, thinking about, recognizing that there, that there may be a need for us to come up with a creative solution um, before we can begin to get the benefit of elementary planning. So it is something that actually is incorporated into the kindergarten discussion. So but I would this like is to for kids who are currently in kindergarten who are going to first, first grade, grade next, next year. year. Yes. Correct. Yes, that's what this study. So I'm, I'm going to just leave it there and say we appreciate your input. We understand. Um, I think it is something that um, clearly why this committee funded the elementary uh, planning study and the enrollment study and really, you know, worked with our counterparts in the town to make sure that that funding would be there for that effort. We recognize that there are a lot of moving parts here. There are a lot of unknowns. We do the very best we can. There is no one that wants to go back to the class sizes that we had in 2003, okay, where we had 28 and 29 in elementary classes. So nobody wants to go there. We're, we're not moving in that direction. So I appreciate your input tonight. Thank you. So modulars would not be an option to I, did even I, I don't think remotely I said get that. into a discussion for next I, year. I think I said that we recognize that it's an issue where we're looking at it and things may shift. There may be another opportunity. Sometimes there is some spot redistricting that relieves it. Even we can see the class sizes overall improved with the, um, the shift to the separate programs, the separate half day and full day really allowed us to achieve, achieve a little bit more evenness across the district. So it's just not, it's not an item that the committee is gonna to discuss tonight. Part of the public input for in this, this part of the agenda is really just to hear what people have to say. I only commented because I wanted to add that I think it is incorporated into our agenda item um, for this evening. It's part of the report. But I, we appreciate you know, the situation. Uh, I think all of us have had children in the district and we understand that kids, they go through a grade once and you want it to be the best experience that it can be and so do we and I, I can say that I was in your place um, 16 13 years ago no oh my god 16 years ago so um, no mr. Bogan yeah well first of all thank you for the comment um, Elaine I, I would just ask for a future agenda item doesn't have to be tonight but to Clarify what I heard there was that this was more a question of two cohorts of students, and I have the numbers from the 1920 projections that we had in our last meeting for K through five um, for Birch Meadow. And there's two cohorts of kids, one in, in kindergarten in 1920 projected, and the other in first grade. Mm -hmm. And and the numbers do stand out, right? So there's 23, 23, 24, and then 24, 24, 24, right? And K and first respectively. And I if you do the math, right, 24 times 3, you know, and then you divide by 4 instead of 3, instead of a class of 24, you get a class of 18. So if there was some way that space allowed and budget allowed us to add an FTE to what is projected to be the, the first grade class next year, you would drop those class sizes from 24 to 18. So that's 
just the math of it, and, and this cohort, these two cohorts are going to move all the way through all 12 years together. So I, I, I do think it's worth two things in a future agenda item. One is just what we've learned in the past about assessing space at Birch Meadow and whether we've ever looked at modulars there or were, not. There were modulars. There used was, to be. There used to be modulars. So, so that would be kind of what understanding the history of that for those who, you know, like myself who don't remember that, uh, and who are, are maybe new to the to the school system, and then secondly, just you know, any options that may exist to address what I think are about 18 students that in these two cohorts that are in larger class sizes than what you see across the rest of the schools Thank would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Just really quickly, um, did the enrollment numbers for the projections, did they include people that are coming back in, like from private kindergarten to? to, to for all the students that we know of, okay. yes. Okay, so there could potentially be more that we don't know of? I mean, we have a pretty good handle of what private kindergarten students are coming in. Okay, thank you. Uh, that doesn't include move-ins, because we don't know who's moving in. Who's building a McMahon. Obviously. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Ms. Oh, did you have public input? A comment on the consent agenda. Um, I need to take from Ms. Sprowski first. Can I uh, and remove the yep. barrows from the consent agenda? Yeah, we need to remove the barrows from the consent agenda. I don't, we don't typically take comments on the consent agenda. Mr. Mr. Corn. So we're, we'll remove from the consent agenda right now the Barrows School and the approval of the minutes. Um, so, Ms. Sprowski. Um, so when the time comes to vote separately on yeah. the Barrows donation, I just wanted to make the committee aware that um, it was focused on the fifth grade at Barrows. I have a fifth grade at Barrows. I'm one of the contributors to the cause, so I don't feel that I should participate in the vote. So I'll abstain from that vote. So why don't we make a motion to accept the donation to the Coolidge Middle School because we have three separate items. Let's just do that. Yep. Um, Second. Seconded by Mr. Robinson. All those in favor? Great. Um, now, uh, motion to accept the donation to the Barrows School. Second. Let's second it. Dr. Baxter seconded. All those in favor? Four. four. Any abstains? Um, okay, and Mr. Quorum, would you, is it something you feel like we can co just make a quick correction and amendment to the minutes? The minutes say that I asked uh, if the number of full day slots could be reduced, but what I actually asked was how the number of full day slots was determined because, you know, relating to the previous point, it oh. looked like we had a large first grade and that it might have been better to not have as many full day Ks in order to provide space for the okay. first so grade to expand. If that so is I, amended, I, you know, it, it sounds like I want to reduce the number okay. of full day kindergarten spots, right? That's not what I'm asking. It was specifically, um, that wasn't the point of my question. Parent, parent Jeffrey Kern asked if the number of full day slots. How could, the number is determined. How the number of full day slots is determined. So, um, Do you want me to yes, amendment. amendment. I would propose, I think it's a friendly amendment if we can all agree. Parent Jeffrey, page thir three of those minutes. Parent Jeffrey Quorum asked how the number of full day slots were determined instead of the sentence, Parent Jeffrey Quorum asked if the number of full day slots could be reduced. Is that? Yeah. Okay, great. So all those in second, somebody second? Second. Mm -hmm. Mr. Boyvin, all those in favor of the friendly amendment? Five zero and a motion on the minutes. Just to, do that. Minutes, Just to do the minutes, it's not there. Oh, oh, I move to approve the minutes January. for um, January 28, 2019. Second, all those in favor? Five zero. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Okay, now reports. So, more is not here this afternoon. Um, no Nothing from Director of Student Services. 
Gail, are we starting with you? Yep. Starting with me. Okay. As part of the packets that you have in front of you, there are several memos that we have that we have included that will be included as part of the final packet that gets posted on the memos that we have been working with facilities and the town manager on. So I will step through each of them. The first one that we wanted to provide an update to the school committee is in regards to the FY20 budget. As you know, the school committee approved the budget which we forwarded to the town manager in accordance with the charter he had it prior to January 31st. As discussed during the school committee presentations held in December and January, we indicated that the schools have been experiencing a significant increase in special education, out of district tuition and transportation. The budget that was presented and approved did not include funds for potential settlements, unknown student placements, or unanticipated increases in tuition rates at the various schools. During the budget process, we estimated this figure could be hundreds of thousands of dollars, and at this point, we do not have certainty over those numbers, so we did not include them within the budget that we presented. During this time, we have also had several meetings with the chair, the vice chair of the school committee with the chair and vice chair of the finance committee as well as the town manager to express concerns we have over the accommodated costs for these figures. Included in your packet this evening is a memo from Bob LaRocher, the town manager, indicating that as part of his process of gathering the budget and presenting it to finance committee and then eventually to town meeting he is reallocating three hundred thousand dollars within accommodated costs to the schools for specifically for out of district tuition and transportation while we do realize that finance committee town meeting vote bottom line we have committed that those funds are going towards out of district tuition and transportation that is where we see the need the additional funding is a reallocation of existing funds within accommodated costs, so it is not a change to the operating budgets within the schools or the town. As part of this process, as each of us go through and update our figures, Bob also was going through and looking at all of their accommodated costs, and this is he's reallocating from healthcare based upon preliminary information he has. Well, his numbers are not final either he is comfortable that this is a reasonable reallocation within those funds. This is very much appreciated on our part. It helps to reestablish the baseline for us going forward for accommodated costs. Mm -hmm. But what we do want to caution the committee is we did say that was the lower end of our range. It's a tremendous amount towards the gap we have in the budget, but there is still the potential that once we have all of the final numbers for out of district transportation and tuition, there may still be the need to go forward to town meeting to request additional funds at the beginning of next year. But this is definitely a very positive step in that direction. So this is what will be moving forward to finance committee as well as town meeting. And then if it's approved through both of those avenues, we will come back and have the school committee do a final approval mm -hmm. of the budget. Um, so we're just very appreciative of all the work that um, you've put in, Dr. Doherty and Mrs. Dowd, with the town manager and the town staff, and you know, and also I, the meetings with the FinCom. I don't know if we got any FinCom members here, but it's been um, a lot of dialogue. So I look forward to talking to them later in the month, Mr. Robinson. So I guess technically it's so the town manager deemed our budget out of balance because so he's we're gonna that we have to vote on this again correct our budget because it's three hundred thousand dollars more now what will happen is this is part of the so we presented a balanced budget right. to fin to the town manager which he has acknowledged was a balanced budget based upon all the meetings we've had with him he understands the difficulty we're having with the out of district tuition. So he is recommending to finance committee and then town meeting to change these numbers. So based upon discussions I have had with Bob, we the school committee does not actually need to vote and approve it until the funds are actually approved to be allocated to us. So once it goes through 
finance committee and town meeting, we would bring it back to school committee to have them approve it. There is still potentially the chance that it would not get approved through finance committee um, through the stages. So now it's, beca it's becoming part of Bob's proposed budget to finance committee to reallocate the funds. They've got to give us the money before we can spend it. Yeah. So, Mr. Blank. So, yeah, so Gail, I always carry my budget book with me before I go. <laughs> In this case, it came in handy. Um, so just to flag this for, for when this comes hopefully back to this committee, it's page 35 of the budget book, mm -hmm. and the line item there is tuition out of district. Mm -hmm. We could also allocate it to transportation. We could also allocate yes. it to right. transportation, but um, most likely it would be the tuition. If you do tuition out of district, it's a 8.5% increase. Yeah. Right. So this is not like... This is, this is very appropriate for the types of errors we've seen. You know, we were well over 5% in our, tr we transferred over 5% additional fund, 5% of the SPED budget this year, we have had to transfer from other mm -hmm. cost, oh, centers, cost centers, right? right. So this is an 8% increase, I get that right? 8.5% increase, so that's, that feels about right to me. So I just, right. and, and as long as my only request for the committee would be that we would vote it into that line item on page 35 for tuition out of budget and, and put it in, in not just in the cost center but in that mm -hmm. specific item okay right well that it would goes be my recommendation right. to the committee yeah. it needs to go in the accommodated right yeah. the accommodated section uh, of the special but yeah, right which is also part of this budget book so thank you I just, I, and, mr and, robinson and mrs dow just said it but i think it's important to emphasize just to be very clear that this isn't a uh admission by the, the school committee that that's what that cost is going to ultimately be right. it's it's uh it could be more could be less i mean Correct. but uh it was where the town manager was able to as we sit here today find money right that is correct and health insurance sorry just really quick and i'll mm -hmm. I'll, I'll stop talking um Historically, we've had seven and ten percent increases the last two years in special ed. So again, this is actually on the lower end of the range of growth. So I think I think this is spot on in terms of past, um, kind of in, in consistent with and in line with past unanticipated growth. That I, I think this is very um, well calibrated to the likely need. So, mm -hmm. thank you, Dr. Doxer. Um, I I think I don't know if it was my hearing, but I needed to make a clarification slash ask. So I heard the word error said about this, but it, it wasn't an error, it's unanticipated tuition costs. It's things we could not have planned for. So it wasn't a mistake that was that. made. No, I think um, Mr. Did Boyden I said the word error, but I think he was really talking about just the, um, as we do the transfers into special education and we've had this, this gap I think that you were referring to yeah, that. Yeah, we, we've know had to move money, error. Linda, and it's yeah, about sorry. 5% of our budget, so I'm sorry if I used a term to, imprecisely. He was referring Thank to moving you. the money yeah. from cost center, the cost center reallocations, right. which, yeah, if we, we don't get it perfect at the beginning of the year, we often reallocate. And, and Gail is building the budget conservatively in the sense that we're not guessing. It's, it's only the special ed costs we're fairly certain, but we're certain there's going to be unknown and I these know. are those unknowns. They're not certain. You only do the known unknowns, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Sprowski. Thank you. We're certain no of That's right. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to make the brief, um, to express my gratitude. I know we've all done it, but um, I think it's important to acknowledge the work that you folks have done with the town side to develop this very mutually respective, very collaborative <coughs> relationship. Um, it's existed for years. It's existed for my whole tenure in local government. And this memo and this work sort of the mutual understanding of challenges that are being faced and how can we help each other. Um, I have relationships with school committee members in different communities, and that is not the case in every town at all. At all. At all. We are special in this way. We are very, very special. This town is special in the level of mutual collaboration between the municipal and school side. It makes us a stronger community. It makes it better to work here. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge the work that you're doing to maintain those relationships, but also to just highlight it for folks. Um, it's not something you want to take for granted because we're mm -hmm. very, very lucky to have it. So I'm very grateful for this work. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Stout. And we will keep the committee surprised as we move through, but this will be presented to next step is to finance committee. Okay. 
the next, you have the capital update? I have capital update. Okay, so. The so. Next set, so the, there are two pieces to the capital update. And I do want to start by saying we have communicated to the committee throughout the budget process as well as our regular updates that we will be providing frequent, I would say periodic, but now I'm going to change it to frequent updates to the committee on the status of the three significant capital projects that we have going on. I will caution that the security one, while there is an update in here, it is a very high level and that will continue to be at a high level. Any specifics would be held um, as part of an executive session due to the nature of that capital <coughs> program. Um, so one of the first items I wanted to point out is there is a second memo and set of reports that we also have been working very closely with the town manager on um, as well as facilities. When we did the budget presentations in January, the first night, we presented the FY20 capital plan as it relates to the school. As part of that, we indicated that the item we had in there for the Coolidge HVAC work was mostly li most likely going to be deferred out a year. Um, and that's based on the work that the facilities department does to look at when we actually need to have these repairs and replacements done. It had originally been in FY21, got moved to FY20, and now we are moving it back out to FY21. The rationale to that is that we are looking to make room within the capital plan for the Turk 2 replacement. One of the other items that we do have in here is we have reduced the cost we're carrying for the Turk 2 replacement. One of the items we discussed at the last meeting was the decision that we made to move forward with replacing Turk 2 as is in not doing the extension. So by doing that, we are reducing the estimate because the estimate we had in there was a full estimate, including mm -hmm. the replacements. Um, so the capital plan that is in there is the one that um, we have received from the town manager that is balanced. It has the turf to include it in there as part of the debt schedule. Again, a lot of these items will be being brought forth as part of the town meeting warrant to obtain approval to do the borrowing and whatnot. So they have not officially been approved, but he has balanced the capital plan. So we wanted to keep the committee apprised of that as well. So this is what he will be bringing forth to finance committee as well as town meeting as of now. The last item that you have is a memo that we have been working this week up until this morning with the town manager as well as facilities to do a quick update on the three significant capital projects. We are also working to make sure that we're keeping all of the elected boards informed with the information, so that's why it, it, it might not have looked been as smooth. We are making sure we're keeping all the committees forward. The select board is receiving the same updates in their packet that's going out tonight for their meeting On next Tuesday. week. And as we prepare for finance committee and town meeting, we just want to make sure everybody has all of the updated information. We do want to make sure that the committee knows that we are planning on March 28th to do a more formal update on the status of the capital plan, specifically these three product projects, because we feel we'll have a lot more information. Um, Joe Huggins from facilities will be attending that meeting as well to provide all of the updates. But and he is here now as a resource. Phone a friend in case. Um, so we, we have been making forward progress. Again, we're still early on. We do want to just remind the committee and the community that all of these projects were just funded as part of the November town meeting. So we are just at the beginning phases of hiring the consultants and beginning the preliminary work. So we have oh made God, forward progress on the elementary school space needs. We, following the Mass General Law, procedures, we have hired GNAP design for um, our house doctor. So that was done in conjunction with the town procurement. Um, Joe Huggins from facilities, we went through the process. The school was represented on the selection committee. So we assisted in ranking those who responded to it. So it was a very, very collaborative process between the town, the school, um, and facilities. We did have 
a kickoff meeting. We just had it at the end of January where Dr. Doherty and myself, the representatives from DNAP and Joe Huggins met to scope out the project, make sure we're all on the same page about what it is we're going to be doing moving forward. We talked about the enrollment study that we want done as well as having them develop a timeline so that we can come back to the committee in March and really lay out a time frame for folks as to when we believe we'll be getting information, what then happens, and what all of the steps are in the process. Again, this is step one of a very lengthy process. Um, based upon the meeting that we have, DNAP is currently preparing a proposal with NESDEC, who is one of the agencies that actually does school enrollment studies, so we are working with them to design the proposal and scope of services, so we will be having another meeting in mid-February with them to start that process. Um, and again, we will be presenting to the school committee in March, and then we'll be working with the chair to schedule additional meetings and to have DNAP actually come and present to the committee mm -hmm. in the May and June time, June time frame to walk through what they've done, where we are, and what the next steps are. Sure. No, I had a go ahead. I had a question on some, yeah, one of the other items in the memo. And Step two or the security. I'll wait. Okay. Maybe I'll answer it before you ask it. So for turf two, we had um, we have moved forward. We're working very closely between Dr. Darty and myself. Uh, we have involved athletics and recreation as needed throughout this. We actually are working very, very closely with DPW on this process. Given their engineering expertise, we actually have utilized them very closely in determining the company that we are utilizing on this project. They have the skill set necessary. They worked very closely with us. We were involved in reviewing all of the firms that they recommended and it was a joint decision on who to utilize but given their expertise we are relying very heavily on them in the early phases of this we actually had a two-hour kickoff meeting yesterday on this that involved facilities dr darty and myself dpw engineering town manager and the firm the architectural firm that we're using on this so we had a very good discussion with them to really go through the scope of work they asked they had two pages of questions for us um, so now that process is is kicking off as well and we're pro most likely going to have a meeting again with them in the next couple of weeks to get an update where they are we are working very diligently to obtain the best pricing we can in advance of April time meeting to make sure that we're in a good place for the numbers that are being forth for April town meeting. So we do hope to have a good update at the end of March when we come back to present that information. I have a question. Want to take questions on um, turf two? Sure. Okay, hold on. Um, Dr. Oscar. So officer. before you mention, thank you, the, the thoroughness, So there are so many projects going on at the same time, it just makes my head spin. So thank you, and Joe, thank you for making this happen and being so clear with us. Um, I was sort of surprised when I heard that the decision was not to do the extension on this turf because I think I had heard for years how close the boundaries were. No. And so I just, or I'm not sure. I'm just wondering if you can explain to me what that means. Originally, we were looking at the potential of expanding the field, but based upon discussions with recreation, with Tom Zaya, there is, we have no Title IX issues. There are no issues with the length of the field. When we started to look into it with engineering and DPW, there were a lot of hurdles to come over in order to do it based upon the trees and natural habitat that surrounds it and right, items that are underneath that I may not be saying from a conservation standpoint that it would be very difficult to lengthen the field. And then when we determined there was no actual requirement to extend it, and given the price differential, that was one of the items we had brought back forth to the committee, and the committee then directed us to not 
proceed with looking to extend it since there was actually no requirement to do it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Boyer. So, Gail, two quick things, um, actually three. So, memo says you'd have to move sewer and water lines and walking paths. That, that sounds if expensive. We to, that would be if we extend it. If we so extend we don't it. have to we do extend. So we extend. don't but have we're to not, do we're not extending We're not extending. All right, so are we doing lights or no lights? We are, we are pricing it out with lights. Good. So we okay. are basically, the way we will be doing it is as is, as is with lights, as is with lights and fencing. So and it currently has lights. So we are basically pricing it with all, ad alts to determine <laughs> what we can afford to do, but we are definitely including the lights within it. For <laughs> turf two, for turf two only. Turf two, turf two only. And what happened yesterday? It says there was a meeting Wednesday, February sixth. That is the meeting we had with the director of DPW engineering, John, myself, Joe Huggins, and the consultants from the design firm. Where we met, to where they walked through with two pages of questions for us as far as are you painting the field with lines? Is it? field hockey, soccer, netting. So we basically, they went through their list so that they can begin to pull everything together so that they have a good indication of what our expectations are for the scope of work. And that's where we did discuss, they had already come out and did a 3D scan, scan of what's currently out there and they've walked through what the steps are from here forward. So it was really a kickoff meeting with all of us to set expectations and then give them more direction moving forward as to what our expectations are. Thank you. Mr. Robinson. Uh, I just, <clears throat> I support this decision and I think just with the, the backdrop that this originally came to us because uh, what I'll call a nice to have uh, where, it, where if we extend that field because under the rules of lacrosse, the girls field is bigger than the boys. So that's actually a, uh, the size of for what a boys game would be, but the girls have the access to the stadium to play their game. So if we didn't have the stadium, then I'd say we have to do this because we need a home place for the, for the girls to play. But uh, with, with this extra cost and everything else we're doing, I, it just, uh, we just can't do it at this time. The main thing is to, Get it, get it safe at, at, you know, under, under the size that it is now, and that, that's what we're doing, right? right they, they also use Parker, Chuck, just so you know. Yeah. yeah. I think, um, and we did put into the budget some additional right. funding for potential transportation if needed, if this we if the field wasn't forward. safe or usable at the beginning of the we year. We actually yeah. feel from a pricing perspective that the time frame that we have, most likely we will have to take turf two offline during the fall, but that will afford us the best oh. options. And we, at once we definitively know that, we will make sure that both recreation and Tom have all of their plans in place. But we did build in right. funding for that contingency. Mr. Robinson. So actually, that that brings up another question I had. I thought I read something in here that now you do believe that it's gonna have to come offline for the fall or, or, or are we still just estimating that it may? Right now we are anticipating that if the project gets funded based upon timing and availability of when the construction would be able to happen that it would be taken offline in the fall. If we're able to shift it, but in meeting with the consultants, they also believe that that would be when the timing of when it would happen based upon when funding would be available, when we would be able to put the bids on the street and then line up all of the, the work to be done. And all the, can I? <coughs> yeah. And all the, the uh, alternative plans are, are set in place at this point in terms of what we would do? We have been working with Recreation and Tom. It is one of the takeaways that we had from the meeting yesterday to make sure that they have pretty much lot. When we talked to Tom, he was already working under that assumption. So we now just need to make sure that. They're aware this could happen. Yeah. So right, but I think I'm hearing it's gonna happen. So uh, they should be working under that basis and not that it may happen, right? The tough part about it is 
it will happen as long as funding is approved <coughs> through town meeting, and that's the right. one part that's right. out of our control. But we have had we had conversations with Tom this morning to let him know that we're aggressively moving forward, yeah. and yeah. his plan should be finalized. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've got the security piece. The last piece again is is meant to be a very high level overview. Again, we are not going to be able to get into specifics, but we did want to make sure we kept people apprised of this. This is a project that is a dual project between the town and the schools. We're working very closely with the town, facilities, police, ourselves on this project. Due to the size of the project, we had to hire an OPM. And I remember the great presentation that Allison Jenkins yeah, and Max and Ellen mm -hmm. came out here to walk us through the requirements and what that process is. So we followed all of those procedures. Again, Allison Jenkins and Joe Huggins worked very diligently on getting all of the documents out there, following all the rules and requirements. The schools were part of the selection process. Um, we have selected the firm STV to be the OPM. The good news is that the individual who is assigned to this project for the town of Reading is very familiar with the town of Reading because he was the OPM on the library project. So he is very familiar with us. That was a very successful project. He worked very well with the library, with facilities, and the town manager. So we're actually very excited to be able to work with him again on this project. Um, so this is again at the very preliminary stages. We just entered into the agreement with them. Um, we are in the process of setting up meetings for next week. I think we have two meetings that we're looking to set up next week to do the next pieces of this to act to formally kick off the project. Um, what I will say is that we are working very closely with the town manager to set up an executive session between all of the boards to further discuss this project as part of that. Ms. Robinson. So that, that, that was my question, uh, and this has meant no disrespect to, to the uh, Finance Committee, but I guess I want to rethink whether, I mean, with the Finance Committee in that, it's what, what reviewing high, it's very sensitive material. You're, you're talking about an executive session of probably 25 or plus people and not being an elected board, uh, I think that library trustees are also library there. trustees. Is they're elected. Uh, it's in your memo. School committee. Oh, school committee. And your memo says finance committee. Yeah. And I think I believe that, that they, they were. I think they, they were part of the last one that we had. Uh, in I the think school. it might have been the the chair and the and the vice chair. Yeah. I don't think it not extended the to the we can nine. we can certainly we discuss something that, that I mean it does that gets a lot of tentacles out you know mm -hmm. uh, and it's just very sensitive and that's again no disrespect I just I don't know not being an elected board whether that whether that would whether they'd be covered under any yeah, if we something can, happened we can take a look into that um, Dr. Doxer I do have a question but I'm going back um, I'm going back to the elementary school space needs um, study that we're doing and we're doing the enrollment study and I keep questioning myself whether I should even ask this question out loud but I'm going to because I think it's important. Um, one of the things we need to know from this enrollment study is not just what numbers are doing, whether we're getting more kids. It's been very clear that part of our issue is with space is the needs of our children, not just the numbers of our children. And I'm wondering if this company is able to explore special needs, and I know not by identifying the children, but maybe through hospitals, births, early interventions, to try to figure out how many children are coming up that might be needing, I mean, I know that we're projecting too, so they might not be born yet. So we, but there, that one, as part of this, we're definitely doing not just the census, it's a whole demographic, people yeah. moving in, people getting older, moving out, new families, children, so that is part of it. 
my understanding from the preliminary meetings we've had with them, some of that is formulaic as opposed to truly being able to identify that. What they are doing in addition to the enrollment piece is also a program review as they're going through each of the buildings to say what type of programs, what are we seeing to look at all of the various space needs, but as far as actually trying to predict the number of students per I didn't think so, but I would, I'm going to go out on the limb and say that might be a little bit more. But they do have formulas to they try to figure like out, of it that anticipate. Says based upon what they're seeing in trends and averages that they look to say this is what the population might look at. But the program review is definitely part of it to look at the space we have for our program. I think that's, that's really, really important and we, because we've seen the impact of that in the <laughs> needs for space, the needs for, for, for teachers or other resources that, that to support the students. So, you know, understanding all those program needs is really critical. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is that, are you done with your, is that all your reports, Mrs. Dowd? That, that's my five just, minute report. Just a light, just a light <laughs> one just, tonight. Just a light report tonight. You're over, I'm watching Thank the you. agenda. Done. Anything else? Um, so do we have, um, any other reports before um, we got to do a superintendent and I have some reports. Okay. All right. So we got a couple more reports. Superintendent, committee members, and then we will get on with our curriculum work and professional learning. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and I'll I'll share more later about the kindergarten piece, so I won't obviously yeah. get into that right now. Yeah. I, the the one big piece that I have. Um, the one main piece that I have is so today was the first meeting for the director of student services screening committee um, this was more of a kickoff meeting where we talked about the process talked about um, the next steps in the process so we do have a, a fairly large committee um, consisting of uh, four administrators um, the administrative assistant director of student services uh, we have three teachers on the committee. We have four parents on the committee. Uh, we had a light amount of applicants for these positions. Uh, so pretty much everyone that applied were, were accepted um, into the different roles. So, um, but it is a, it is a very well represented group. Uh, we have parents from preschool all the way to high school. Uh, same with our teaching staff that's represented, one from each level. and. With our administrators, we do have representation, again, from different levels, but also um, the different types of programs that are in the different schools. So it is a very well-represented um, staff. So that committee and the applications are continuing to come in. The deadline for that is at the end of the month, which is February 20th. Um, in the meantime, the committee is going to be meeting again to design questions. Um, and then there will be a full day, maybe more, depending on how many we get, of interviews, um, which is going to be later on in the month. And then the next time we meet on March 28th, hopefully there will be an announcement uh, for the next director. Thank you. So that's, that's my report. Great. Sorry. Uh, Dr. Doxer has a question. Just, just a quickie. Is there someone from CPAC on that committee? There's we have four parents that applied, and there were four parents that were chosen. And are any of them from CPAC? We, they are parents of students with special needs. So, thank you. Other questions? Okay. Uh, any reports from committee members, Mr. Borgen, Mr. Robinson, Dr. Doxer? Yep. I have three actually. So um, I was really privileged last night to go to the dress rehearsal for the um, selfie at the high school. It is a great representation of theater for social change and about how the power of drama and drama um, programs can um, touch both the students and the audiences and how um, the, the benefits of the drama production aren't just based on what the sales are. I want to encourage people who have kids in middle school and high school 
to consider going with their kids or with their kids on the other side of the auditorium, either way, um, because I think it will be an amazing catalyst for conversation, important conversation. It's an especially impressive piece <coughs> of work because it was done by the students. A student had to, Ryan, um, oops, just lost Ryan's <coughs> last name, Ryan Norton, had to work for a couple of years actually with different tasks put in front of him to realize his dream of being a director. And um, he earned his place so that he actually researched and presented the play, found the play, presented it, sold people on the idea of it. Then he worked through casting and all the tech elements and he, was the, he has been the director. Um, adult, adults have been mentors but all of his tech design, um, lighting, sound, that's all done by the kids. And um, I sat there just pulled into the narratives of the characters as well as um, just wowed by what the kids had accomplished and how they could take leadership roles and talk to one another with respect and, and work through challenges. Um, it just, I really recommend that you go. Um, it's this weekend, Friday and Saturday. Um, you can find more information on the high school and the drama club website. But it was really, um, really a great experience. And a second, um, second report is um, I was also lucky to be able to go to the Understanding Disabilities presentation at Coolidge. On Friday, um, it was also a presentation at Parker, Colette DeVito, who is a young woman, a very impressive young woman with Down syndrome who has started her own cookie company. Um, and she spoke to the kids about so many things, but it was very powerful when she addressed the obstacles that she had faced and how sometimes it entailed redefining what her goals were and what her dreams were but that she never gave up and she found her supports. Actually, when she was mentioning who her chief, one of the, the students at Coolidge asked her who her chief support was and she mentioned her mom and the kids, the, the whole auditorium just burst into clapping and it was spontaneous and just wonderful to hear. As a mom, it was wonderful to hear. Um, but um, the kids, it was, it was really impressive to me because A, she's an impressive young woman and B, she was actually hard to understand at times. But the kids, instead of turning to their neighbors or their phones, they were leaning forward. Their postures were indicating how engaged they were in this presentation. And then the questions that they asked were also reflective of what they had heard her say. And so I was just impressed by her and our students. Um, so I just wanted to share that and thank you to Understanding Disabilities for their commitment to our town, for everybody that has funded it and um, for organizing these speakers. Um, my third report. We need to keep going. <laughs> these, are, these are intended to be brief, so let's. So I'm the liaison to RACASA. Um, we're still looking for someone to fill the president and vice president um, position of outreach coordinator. It's a full-time job. Check out on their website to find out more. Um, Kevin Sexton came and he spoke um, with Erica McNamara about the unknowns for CB CBD, which is um, a hemp product and that it's coming into town. And um, there's not a lot known about it. Um, it is legal to sell, uh, but there aren't a lot of ways to measure how much, what the percentage of THC is in this, this chemical. So um, Rakasa is coming out with an information sheet and has one from another town on their website right now. Um, Reading School Projects coming up, the Youth Risk Behavior Survey is being coordinated with the Middlesex League. It'll be online this year. So we'll be able to get some normalizing um, comparisons with other communities. Um, opioid education was done by the school resource officers in the ninth grade health classes. Vaping prevention outreach was at Parker on February 6th. Um, and if you have a chance, check out the slideshow that was done 
um, that marked all the different ways that Julianne DeAngelis, the um, retiring outreach um, Coordinator. community outreach person, all the ways that she has contributed to our town and the addressing of substance use in our town. I know I hear very well that I can't go into it all, but check out that web, that um, it's the slideshow. It's quite a tribute to Julianne and to Rakasa, what has been done over these years and how important it is. Thank you. Ms. Browski. Mrs. Uh, Webb, yes. there's one addendum to the my original report that okay. I just want to add because I think it's important. Um, even though the screening committee met today and, and there's a cross-section of representation, there will be additional opportunities for the community mm -hmm. to be able to uh, interview the finalists once, once we reach that point, and which is um, at the open microphone session. I know that there were parents um, that wanted to be a part of this committee, but because of the time restrictions we have with the interview days and things like that, they may not have been as available. So there is the opportunity when we have the open microphone sessions to be a part of that. So I just want to make sure the community understands that. I appreciate it. That process is an excellent process that really engages the school community, staff, administrators. So appreciate that. It's a lot of work to put that together. And we do that because it's important for the outcome. So appreciate it. Right. Um, I just have, uh, I was actually unable to attend the HRAC meeting this week uh, or last week. And I know Josh Goldus is str struggling to try to uh, schedule the meeting when people can actually attend and have a quorum. So hopefully I'll be able to attend the next one. And I think now we're on to new business curriculum update. Okay. Assistant Superintendent Chris Kelly. And you've got some of your team members here sure. tonight. Good evening. Thank you for having us on the agenda today. Um, I just want to introduce a few of the members of my team. This isn't my entire team, obviously. Um, in your school committee packet, there's actually a whole uh, kind of bio and, and tasks of the team, but I thought I'd just introduce them while they're here. Uh, this is Heather Leonard, our STEM coordinator, and this is Allison, and she's our humanities coordinator. So um, we have a brief presentation on the many, many things that we've been doing this year uh, so far on professional learning and, we're, and teaching and learning and all of the curriculum work we've been doing. We're very excited to share just a brief snapshot of what's going on in the Reading Schools. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, it won't be a long one, <laughs> feel free to ask them. Okay. So we wanted to include our overview of, of sort of what we do, and this really framed what we wanted to talk about tonight. When we decided what we were gonna talk about, it was really hard to determine sort of a day in the life, a week in the life, a year in the life. Um, as you know, we're a brand new team. We all started, um, I started July 1st, and Heather and Allison came on board around the same time. But I, I really feel like our boots on the ground day started when teachers and students came back. That's when we really started diving into sort of what is going on in Reading and how can we build on the structures that exist or build the structures if, if necessary. So really our team is focused on two sort of diverse uh, pieces and what's really exciting about it is we look at learning from pre-k to 12 but then we look at adult learning too um, and I think one of the things that really excites me about working with the team that I have here um, is that we're all uh, adjunct professors we've done a lot of coursework so we've done a lot of work with adult learners and that's really exciting obviously we're all teachers as well so we've done a lot with curriculum and with working with students so under the curriculum um, if you look, you follow it. We're gonna to talk tonight really primarily about the curriculum guides, which are somewhat done at certain grades. They're very done and in process, we're gonna give an update on that. We're gonna talk about that renewal cycle that I mentioned a few weeks ago at our last school committee meeting um, with where, where is this going to fit in? What is our sort of strategic plan with that? And how far are we in developing that? And then we're also gonna be discussing the professional learning that we talked about, the adult learning. 
um, that's a big part of the work we do. A lot of times when um, I introduce myself as the Assistant Superintendent of Learning and Teaching, people kind of just look at me like, what does that mean? Um, and that's really the whole learning and then teaching. It's not just teaching children, it's teaching adult learners too. So we're gonna talk about what that looks like in Reading, the committee work that is ongoing and will be going on, and then our professional learning how we how do we do that? How do we deliver high quality professional learning opportunities? So we also wanted to show you the organization of how this works. So obviously, uh, John is the superintendent of schools, and I'm the assistant superintendent. Um, and you see next to me, I have the curriculum coordinators. We have two. Um, and they collaborate, consult, advise. So we, I would say that we talk daily. We, we often talk multiple times a day. Um, and they are constantly researching with me, going to district meetings, going to state meetings, going to regional meetings, and we're constantly looking at what the current research is saying. We're also doing a lot of dipsticking in our own community of what's going on, what is the data telling us. Um, and in your packet, you also have um, other members of our learning and teaching team, we're lucky enough to have two coaches as well that work within our team structure. They're in your packet. Um, our data coach, Courtney, um, works as an integral member of our team. We're constantly asking her to dig deep and look at the, um, what the data is telling us. She meets regularly with the district leadership team and does a lot of data work with them and she's been coaching them really for the last couple of years in her role. But this year we've really expanded that role and she works intimately with myself and with the two coordinators um, to, to really look at data. How do we use the data um, to guide our instruction as we start really um, making systemic changes of how do we make sure that kids are learning and how can we show what they've learned. Um, that data piece is very, very important. We also have our behavioral health coach. As you know, we are really proud of the work that Reading's done in social emotional learning. Um, and a lot of that work was done through um, the school transformation grant that we were lucky enough to get. And now we're really lucky to have Lauren, who is part of our team, who's helped guiding us she takes a lot of the data points. We look at office referrals, we look at attendance rates, and she certainly does a ton of training. So as we talk about the professional learning and the teaching that goes on, she's part of that team. So Courtney and Lauren, who aren't here, Lauren just had baby number two, so she's home on maternity leave. She'll be back soon. Um, and they, they also do a lot of the professional learning with staff along with the two of us. And then we work obviously really closely with principals. Uh, principals are the educational leaders, they are the instructional leaders of their building, and we're constantly checking with them. So you can see that green box kind of encompasses all of that. Um, when we have um, team meetings with, with um, the principals, we're often sitting at the table talking about what, what's going on. Um, and then if you go down to the next level, we work along with teachers, and within that, we work with the coaches, not that wasn't athletic coaches, we're talking about the learning coaches uh, that I mentioned, but also the department heads at the high school. Um, they are doing a lot of instructional leadership alongside with Kate Boyton, the principal, and myself. So this is sort of the structure of the, like who are the people in my neighborhood? These are the people in my neighborhood. So thank you for letting us visit you today and um, I know you have a lot of places to be so we get really excited to talk about this stuff so the chance to share the work is really exciting. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about the curriculum guide work that we've been doing so for those who haven't had a chance to check them out um, there's spaces on the learning and teaching department on the website that these are housed and you'd find the science and mathematics that are currently produced K-5 under the STEM page and the reading and writing on the humanities page. Um, so the purpose of the curriculum guides is to start to have vertically articulated um, documents that allow us to look at what we would expect our students to experience within and across disciplines as they progress vertically through our schools. The documents themselves really take the state frameworks that are our driving force and try to formulate them in a way that you can see what are those focus and priority areas for the grade levels, 
um, what are those skills and content standards, both those practice standards and the content that they need to know, and what might it look like as a student goes through their experience in those years. So as you look through the guides, they vary depending on the content level, and as we continue, um, they'll look a little different as you go through the grade levels, but they give us a consistent way of a snapshot of what would life look like as a grade two student in mathematics, and what might that look like through the course of their year with primary focus on those learning standards the state is really setting forth as our goals and our priority areas. And on the back page of each of the guides, what you would actually find is that it kind of gives you an overview some of the terminology within the different guides varies a bit, so you might see things like essential questions, what's the difference between a content standard and a practice standard. So that last page gives you a bit of a glossary to, to define for you the different components of those guides. Um, so we, um, they continue to be posted and, and we've taken feedback from parents and from teachers as we've gone. Um, and currently produced are the, as I mentioned, the math and science K-5 and the reading and writing K-5 are currently up, but more to come. You can talk. Yeah, so um, the update on that is that we've published uh, K-5 to curriculum guides, as Heather said, in the areas of math, science, um, and English, we have writing and reading K-5. to um, We also have some others that haven't been vetted yet in social emotional learning. Those are, are ready to go, but I'm waiting for someone to come back from maternity leave and we're gonna continue to process that. The other thing is we're working on the high school ones. Um, we've been working on them all year and we expect to have drafts out at some point this spring. Um, not every single high school, high school course will be represented at this time. Um, we concentrated on the core classes, um, primarily the, the freshman and sophomore classes in subjects, but in some cases it's junior classes too. Um, not APs, APs have their own guides, which we'll talk about later. Um, one of the things that we're really proud of is that we created this template that we're using all of the grades will have a similar district-wide template. And so for instance, on the front, you will see what students will learn and should know, be able to know how to do, taken from the state standards. And like, th like in other words, what does fourth grade science look like? It doesn't matter what school you go to, this is what you can expect, right? Um, on the back, there may be terminology that's subject specific. Math may have essential questions or different things. And then we have a third page that really defines vocabulary that parents and the community members may not be familiar with. You know, what is a content sta standard? What is a practice standard? What are the frameworks? Things like that, um, as well as specific subject questions. Um, one of the things we're really excited about is when NIAS came in and did their work at the high school, one of the things that they commented on is that we're drafting these and they, they suggested we use the same template for across the district and we were already ahead of that. So the high school ones will be published um, and the same process will be used for high school that we've used up to now, which is we will vet them internally with staff first with questions and comments and then we will vet them externally and most likely we'll do them by subject. So we'll do, you know, we're gonna publish the math ones on these days and look for feedback. We're gonna publish the science ones on these days. So we'll be more to come on that, but definitely the high school ones are um, in various stages of second and third drafts. So we're excited about that. We've just started working on some middle school ones. So again, you know, we're doing a lot in six months time. Um, we've tried to be really mindful. Our goal is to have pre-K to 12. Uh, at least these curriculum guides, the front and back, really, really tight and embedded and done by the end of next year, pre-K to 12. So this is something I mentioned the other um, day at the school committee meeting about our curriculum renewal cycle. And there's been a lot of questions about like where do, do curriculum um, renewals happen? When do we spend the money? When do we look at things? So if you look at the top, the curriculum development, this is the process that we sort of start the process. So sometimes it's because there's been a change in standards. Uh, and the state says, oh, wait a minute, now you have to do this, or this is an addition, or in social studies case, it's a brand new curriculum. I mean, not brand new, we're not inventing history, but uh, the way the state is un unpacking it looks very, very different. So, for instance, history K-12 to would be in that yellow box, and now we have to decide how are we gonna use time, resources, and staffing to support that change. Sometimes we end up in that sort of, and I, I use the, the analogy of a clock, in that 11 to one o'clock uh, range, 
because of the death. We look at MCAS scores and or we look at um, district scores. We do a lot of um, district assessments, formative assessments, and we say, hmm, this is something we're really seeing that, and we're just starting to unpack that. Being new to the team, we're starting to look at that and say, what does the data tell us? And that may cause a curriculum development. Or the third thing might be, um, and some of this work is going on, is that we're really looking at curriculum in a broader sense. We might be restructuring the way we teach things, the pathway in which we teach something, or looking at different <coughs> levels, looking at different programming, um, and that would, again, be in sort of that 11 to 1 o'clock range. And then you can see, you go down to the curriculum mapping piece, which is when teachers get together to say, okay, we know what we're going to teach, we're going to be playing around with that, and I'm going to pass this off to Heather, she can explain a little bit about that, but then we go down to that, that phase. So, Heather? Um, so a great example of the curriculum mapping phase right now is, is elementary mathematics. So it's something that um, six years ago we adopted a curriculum program that was aligned with the shifted standards. It's been implemented in the different schools and the orange arrow that we've been on has been implementing that program, finding what works well, finding where there's glitches, continuing to bring in ongoing professional development that's associated with math and focus, but also some additional curriculum tools to help supplement and make sure we're approaching our mathematics in the strongest and most comprehensive way possible. Um, so we've really taken a systemic look at what does it mean, and what do we need, and where are we? And so we've spent a good block of time, and it's really and in a well timed arrived us at this curriculum mapping. So now what we're actually doing is we have a, a committee of teachers and administrators and we're working together to actually map it out. What are we using to meet which standards? When are we using it for how long and how will we know if we've approached that? So this is really creating teacher documents that are starting to create some of those details. Those are your recipes for your cookbook that really help us as a as a district-wide group to increase our levels of consistency both across schools and vertically. Um, but this is where we're taking all of that information that we've been doing and starting to actually create those internal um, documents that allow us to continue to grow and work and they are growing and they change as we continue to work through that mapping process because it's never done. Just like a cook in the kitchen, you know, you know how to tweak and improve and, and make things better. Um, so that's something that will continue to happen, but um, it is something that we're taking those pieces and really being systemic about where are we, what is this going to look like as we go through the process. I just have a quick question. So um, how do the curriculum guides relate to the curriculum maps and who are the audiences for those? That's a great question. Um, so the guides themselves are that big, we use the word snapshot, they give you that idea of what would a student experience in that content area, in that discipline, what might that look like and what are some those driving and priority standards and skills they need to learn. The maps are more the how do we get there and with what. So the guides can be, the audience is everybody. It's our community, it's our parents, it's our teachers, it's our building administrators, it's our district as a whole to get vertical articulation. Um, and students, possibly, absolutely. Um, the maps themselves are really the teacher documents that are really starting to get down towards that, like what are those pieces and those steps? So just like their daily lesson planning, where they're really planning out what are my objectives that I want to achieve, how am I going to get there? But it's really starting that conversation to look critically at what tools are we going to use, when are we going to be pacing ourselves in what areas, um, and building some of that collective conversation um, for the teachers. Thank and you. again, uh, Heather Air mentioned about consistency across grades and consistency from one grade to another. That's sort of the lens that we're looking at. We know a lot of great things are going on and a lot of teachers are doing great things. Um, our goal is to build a, a system of which we can really articulate that, that this is what we're doing across the grades in fourth grade math, for instance, um, and we know this to be true because in third grade this is what's going to happen, in fifth grade this is what's going to happen. And I think a lot of that had been done, but it wasn't memorialized. It wasn't housed in, in usable ways that we can really refer to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Allison? Hi. So if we continue to look at our cycle here, after the curriculum uh, has been developed and then mapped, then we get to that blue box which says analysis and data review. So this is when we're going to ask, well, how's How's it going? What are the challenges that we're seeing? How are these maps playing out in the actual classrooms, in the actual buildings? Um, where are we being successful? What is our data showing us? Um, 
any data points that we have access to. And most importantly, what are our teachers and our uh, principals saying about how these maps are working? So at this point, we're gonna, we may cycle back, revise our maps, or we may decide that we're gonna sort of start to move on to something different depending on where, uh, what the data shows us and what the feedback is um, specifically at the teacher level. So, it, it, you know, one of the things that we wanna reiterate is that we consider curriculum renewal an ongoing cycle. We're not, it's not gonna be done and then we publish it, we put a date on it and then that's where it lives. It's constantly being looked at. Mr. Boyden. Yeah, so help me get from the last slide to this slide. So the guides that we just looked at in the last slide, which box are they on this slide? They would be on the, the top box, curriculum, curriculum development, development, and probably heading towards curriculum mapping. They're definitely on the way to getting curriculum mapping. All right, so there's a guide for everybody, but parents can look at that and understand what their child is mm -hmm. gonna be accountable for in, in each subject. You're gonna have those done by the end of FY20, you hope. Across every grade, a 12. lot of them are already done, right. Okay. Um, and what about in the blue box? Is there a way that you look to see, so if you, know, you have multiple students in different classrooms taking the same subject at the same level, right? It's supposed to be comparable experience. Everybody's supposed to be getting through the guide that we just talked about, right? So does, does anybody record, well, in this teacher's classroom, they, they're all using the same textbook or curriculum. Well, I don't know if you use textbooks anymore. Maybe it's whatever you use, but you, you, you're a certain number of chapters, right, in the curriculum, let's say, right, and it's the same curriculum. So how do we know that this class got through 10 chapters and this one only got through five? Like, how do we, do we collect that in the blue box so we know how far each class got? So we got? don't collect it on what you're talking about, but we do collect data on certain things. Um, things like our reading assessments that we do, we do district-wide math assessments. Um, a lot of our departments at the high school are working at 80% consistency, like for the midterms, mm -hmm. they really looked for 80% uh, consistency across teachers, so like this midterm would 80%, you know, look like another midterm nest. What does that mean? So what that means is that different teachers teach different things, mm -hmm. not every single thing is prescribed. So we're looking for the state standards and we're looking to have more consistency than, and, and still allow for teacher autonomy as well. You know, I might have used a different poem that Allison used in her class. So I may have some questions on a test about that, but overall we both covered alliteration. So those kind of questions would be consistent. So we are definitely looking at consistency. As far as the analysis and data, the data points that we have, there's not a lot of them right now. I mean, we have MCAS for sure. Um, at the elementary, we use Fountas and Pinnell, um, and that we just did a whole retraining on those, and we're collecting those three times a year to look at those across the district and look for patterns and trends. We certainly have, um, AMC math that we use at the elementary level. And then at the high school level, they definitely are looking at things like AP scores, um, midterm grades, grades across each subject. Just yes. To up to that. I mean, yeah. So I mean, you talked about student assessment. That's part of the district accountability mm -hmm. discussion. You talked about what I'll call assessment assessment, which mm -hmm. is looking at the assessments mm -hmm. teachers give as opposed to assessments right. the state gives. I. I really be interested in just, if, if everybody's supposed to be following the same curriculum, uh, uh, accountability or some kind of scorekeeping to make sure that we can check those assessments of the students with how they perform in an assessment with how much of the curriculum was covered mm -hmm. in their class. Mm -hmm. So if there's 10 chapters, I wanna make sure everybody in that class is doing 10 chapters if that's what they're supposed to do and that some kids aren't getting less than 10 and some are getting more. So I, I hear what you're saying. The standards at the state level don't give us that kind of specificity. They give us overarching themes of what the expectation is to be taught. It doesn't give you like this text will be used or this manual will be, will be used. So I think that's part of the work that we're doing is to provide more consistency across the district, not less. So Do they use the same textbooks across the same we, grade for the same We don't subject? always. I mean, we do with certain programs like uh, Heather talked about math, that we use the in-focus program to deliver, but we also use other things too. Um, so, you know, th there is no like state program on yeah, those Yeah, I'm not things. going for the state. I, it seems like a simple accounting of 
this teacher used these textbooks and these, these were the inputs to those, that class. They got five chapters of textbook X, they got three enrichments of website Y, mm -hmm. and they did this other thing. Mm -hmm. Like if, if, if we had a way to, you know, compare how the students perform in aggregate who receive one set of inputs with students who receive a different set of inputs, <laughs> we might learn something about which inputs seem to, in aggregate, be working best for the students. We're definitely working towards that goal. That doesn't exist the way you described it right now, Mr. Boyd. It doesn't seem difficult, but. It's, it, I just. It's seems, just being It seems counting. logical. It, it just what? Like, it's just counting. We, well, we, we covered this many chapters. Right. We covered, like, it just. I'm not sure that difficult. we're actually understanding everything, because when I think about the experience of my students, and I had twins going through, so it certainly gave an opportunity to understand. They had different teachers in the same grade and the same subjects. Now, you know what, just uh, give me one minute. So um, there was a huge amount of consistency um, throughout their educational experience at the high school. It wasn't, it wasn't 100%, but um, I certainly, you know, I saw that. So it seems to me that that is happening. I don't know what the mechanisms are that are doing that? Well, it's, it's all based on the state standards. The teachers understand what the state standards are and they're committed to teaching them. So that's where the consistency exists. Exactly what they use to deliver those standards might change a mm -hmm. bit from person to person. And take Mrs. Barras, uh, Ms. Barras, and kid and to Mr. kid, Robinson. it should. Yep. I have two thoughts on that because it's an interesting point. One is, I would, you said being counting. Can That's you not hear? Sorry. Yep, so, um, Jean. No, sorry. Sorry, everybody. Um, thinking about this idea of how you assess what inputs, right, went into yes. the classroom and then the outcomes and you know, mm -hmm. I think for some subject areas that could, there could be real validity to that. But I'm thinking about you, um, there were two different kinds of, there was, um, there's what you know and what you should be able to do, but you use different phrasing for that. What was it? Performance. Content standards and practice, practice standards. Thank you. Yeah. So there's content standards where I could see that. But a performance standard becomes much more difficult. Yeah, a performance that. standard might be, um, can the student write a paragraph that does X, Y, and yeah, Z? Yeah. Um, and, and doing that across the district, and then also doing it for math, and also doing it for reading, and also doing it for science. It's like, I, I think that could become kind of overwhelming. My thought about mm -hmm. where that kind of thing might belong, and this is probably a question for Dr. Doherty, maybe perhaps more than you, is that seems like it might be getting a little bit into um, staff evaluation. So you're hired and these are the curriculum guides and this is what we expect and I would I would hope that ultimately that becomes part of a conversation during annual reviews is um, you know how far did you get through these curriculum guides mm -hmm. and the principal would have that global perspective right. of um, wow that's really different than what I'm hearing from the other grade X teachers, let me call the other principals in the district, uh, you know, where, so I would hope and expect that that becomes the principal's job to ensure that consistency and address it where it doesn't exist. Right. I don't know if that. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking of parents have been being able to know how what their child is receiving for instruction and pace of going through a shared curriculum mm -hmm. compares to other children in the other classes mm -hmm. in that grade. Just an accountability to the voter that I was thinking about, and I think that's a great question. And if and I think the one piece that maybe um, I should have stated before is when we use the word curriculum, there's many different definitions for that word. Um, some people use the word curriculum and they mean a purchased textbook. Some people use the word curriculum in place of saying Massachusetts State Standard Frameworks. When we're saying curriculum, what we're talking about here is not only the tools you use, but your instructional methodology to getting students there. So the reality is you could give me the same ingredients and my husband the same ingredients, but let me tell you, dinner's gonna come out a lot better if he cooks it. So it's not just what is going in and it's not just setting your timer, but there's absolutely that capacity of having a consistent expectation, understanding who's in front of me today and what are the ways they need me to meet their needs. So yes, we do need to have a basic expectation of some consistency of tools we use. But what it isn't is page 12 on Tuesday, because that's not, we're teaching kids, we're not teaching books. So, you know, we use the tools to teach the kids, and, and so that's why that curriculum becomes a really complicated mix up of both what tools we're using, how and when we're using them, but also making sure we're meeting that end game and that assessment and that data is really what informs did we do it? Did we get our kids there? So. Mr. Robinson had a question. Yeah, so I guess just a, some comments on 
what Mr. Boab and, and Ms. Borowski were saying. I think that, you know, when I look at those boxes, that's, that's the most important one. I mean, we, and I wouldn't want to, and I don't think I'm hearing that we're ever going to be in a situation where, you know, we're going to have parents decide, well, I want my son or daughter to have that teacher because, <coughs> you know, their, their results are, so there needs to be consistency. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, some things aren't a democracy. I mean, you got to, you know, there's some things you got to use. Uh, but my other question on that is, what, is that an ongoing analysis or is there, inter, is there a timeline for how that's done? Or, or so, or? yes. I mean, we're, it's ongoing in the sense that there are some formative assessments that we're constantly doing, and then there are some things that are annual, like MCAS is an annual assessment. We spend a lot of time unpacking the MCAS. We'll do that again, and we'll look for um, differences between the years and start really unpacking that. I mean, you know, I know I keep saying this, but this team is relatively new. So this is part of what we're doing. We, a lot of these things already exist in Reading. There's a lot of consistency in Reading. They're just not memorialized. They're not in a system that's understandable. There's, you know, there's teachers doing great things, consistent teachers looking at the standards saying, by the end of physics, this is what you have to know. What we want to try to do is have guides for everyone and then really some more teacher tools in our toolbox that say, here's what we know to be true in order to get those guides and make sure there's mastery of concepts here are some of the tools the programs that we suggest um, and, the, and the teachers are creating them it's it, it has to come from them they're the ones using these materials and then we'll say all right now looking at the status and looking at the data what it's telling us are these tools working and if not that's where this renewal will come in mm -hmm. so that's what we've been unpacking kind of all year um, let me get Dr. Doxer and then it sounds like you have. I just, I'm, um, I appreciate what you're saying and I have to say that when I was hearing, I understand that we look at our other, our, our neighbor's classroom and we want to say, oh, they, we've done the same books or we've done the same chapters or we, we've done the same things. But that to me is not what's most important and in fact, that can, I think, detract from what our kids actually ultimately take away from the education we're offering them. My joy in learning flags were going off, like the teachers have to be enjoying what they're doing. They need to pick the content that speaks to them, and it might not be the same content. Mrs. Borowski might not pick the same poems or stories or, or math problems that I might. They, share with my students this joy of learning this like this is why you want to know this kids um, and the ultimate assessment would be what the kids got out of this it's like you can't teach to the test because that score in the end isn't going to necessarily reflect that they have the skills to thrive in our world or the motivation to get to tomorrow I just feel like um, what I'm hearing you say is not what I'm hearing, the counting of chapters and making sure that you're in the same place as the class next to you. In the end, along the way, you're learning the same things. Those standards are there and the bar is high, but there needs to be some room for the teachers who have completely different classes of children with completely different needs mm -hmm. to get to that place with the tools that you're providing and the the um, the assessments I don't like using the word assessment because it's fallen right into the same thing but the um, uh, the the lookout towers the the ways to milestones keep milestones thank you so I, I'll give you a brief example of that so the social studies program um, that we're going to be working on is new so the eighth grade curriculum is completely changed. It's a, it's a civics unit. It's all year. We haven't really done it before. All the districts around, we're all kind of figuring out what that looks like. The state has given us a lot of guidance on the milestones. These are the things. These are the mastery core things that they have to know by the end of eighth grade. Certain terms, certain things. But then they've given us a lot of latitude about how we teach that and what projects we do. So, you know, the good news is that that joy of learning, we're all about project-based learning and getting kids kind of immersed in the work. 
because engagement, we know, that's where retention occurs. So we're really excited about imagining the possibilities of that. What tools will we use to make sure those mastery concepts are taught? What tools can we vet and look at, put in teachers' hands, and then say, all right, now let's, where's the magic? How does this look? It's not just open up to page 45 in your textbook. Those kind of lessons, we're seeing less and less of those, and we really want to say, okay, knowing what we know, and now that we've learned, how can we show that in real practice? And I think the only thing that I think is a universal thing that we do in Reading that I think people understand is our real world problem solving in, in junior year, right? That week is taking skills from every department, math skills, statistics, marketing, art, public speaking, research, and really taking all of the things that you learned as a freshman and a sophomore and a junior and saying, junior, we're going to give you a complex project, we're only gonna give you a finite time, and you have to come up with a strategy on how to solve it. And I think that's the kind of thing that we're looking when we talk about curriculum, we're looking for the tools so that we can do that kind of work. Now, not every subject lends itself to that, and not every year will be that, but I think that's where the magic occurs. When we're meeting with the social studies team and we're looking particularly at middle school social studies, those are the things that our, our team is telling us. Okay, we see that the standards have changed. We see that we have to have different core things in our program, but where where's the joy? Where, where, where can we have the kids really bite into this? Any other gonna, questions before no, we go on? I'm going to ask if we can just hold questions till the end because we're running a bit behind. So we're going to hold questions till the end. Okay. And then we'll and we'll take the questions from the committee and the questions from the public. So if you guys can sort of keep your thoughts. So one of the most uh, one of the critical components to any of the work that we do on that cycle is having the input and the engagement from our teachers. Uh, one of the ways that we do that is by having committees. So teachers are investing their time uh, in the areas that they're most interested in or most passionate about. And this year, these are the nine committees that we have happening currently uh, across all the grades. Um, the committees can look different. Some might be short term, meeting four or five times and accomplishing a task. Other committees, like our middle school social studies, which is uh, unpacking an entire new framework that's going to be a more long-term committee probably like 18 months all the way through next year so the engagement of the teachers their input they bring our questions uh, back to the buildings and then bring those responses back to the committee work and it really is an integral part of all the decision making that we're trying to do uh, in our office So uh, as Allison pointed out, these were the committees as of last week. Um, you know, we're constantly <coughs> evolving and constantly adapting to what needs to get done. The Late Start Committee has already um, completed some of their work. We're now looking at some of the uh, concerns that families have to try to make this transition smooth. But when you look at uh, the committee's report cards, we're actually updating the report cards at the elementary level. We expect that committee to be done at the end of this school year uh, with new um, standards-based report cards sent out um, next year um, and vetted with teachers at the end of this year. So you can see this is an evolving process. If I showed you this list in the fall, it, it may look very different. Um, but these are just some of the committee works. This is how we are working on curriculum constantly. Um, we, we do some of this committee work during release time, after school, and we also have plans for summer. Uh, we really try to stay away from the school day in the contractual day. Um, and so a lot of these committees are teachers that have volunteered to work um, on these committees knowing that there is a time involved in it. Um, one of the things that I do want to mention um, is that we, in order to work on some of our social studies things, we've been looking at lots of grant opportunities and we just found out the other day that we received a DESE grant um, to put $7,500 towards this committee work, um, which was a pretty um, competitive grant cycle we, and we applied and we were proud to get it. So that's another thing our team does is we're, uh, we're actually grant writing tomorrow. We, you know, it's part of our regular cycle is to get as much grants to bring money into the district so that we can, um, <coughs> We can, we can do this important work. We can vet um, different things. We can send people to conferences. We can have professional conversations, but our budget doesn't go that far as you know, so we're constantly looking for ways to extend that. Okay. 
So along with the committee work, um, this is another aspect. So we wanted to show you what professional learning and what we, d we decided to do because professional learning for us takes place every day, pretty much every day, all day. Um, we're constantly working and meeting with teachers and our schedules are, are pretty jam packed with meetings and visits to schools. Um, but we wanted to show you a snapshot of what that might look like. So we've brought a few uh, little snapshots along with the committee work and developing that systemic infrastructure that we talked about. This professional learning model takes place in a lot of different ways. So we thought we would just sort of outline some of them by giving you a little snapshot of each. So one of the ways that we provide professional development or professional learning to teachers is during the school day. And this year we've been implementing, teachers have been working to implement the reading units of study. And we've been lucky enough to be working with two consultants who worked really closely uh, with the authors of those units. So it's really been invaluable to have them in district. And the teachers um, have been meeting in grade level teams. Um, they've had two, most of the grades have had two and they're scheduled to have three in total. Uh, the most powerful part of these sessions have been the teachers are being able to visit each other's classrooms and watch these consultants um, do some of their master teaching work and we're getting to help plan that. They're getting to plan alongside these consultants and then really importantly is to debrief afterwards. Um, really that conversation that the grade level teams are having together, especially after visiting the lab classrooms, um, has been invaluable. And I think teachers learning from each other is really the best way and we're hoping that we can grow this lab classroom, teachers visiting other teachers type model um, as we move forward. So we're really excited about that opportunity. Another example of some of our professional learning occur during the early release and in-service days. One showcase example of that is our Wednesday workshops. So. Um, Start, we started in January together with all of the elementary teachers and we're actually modeling our Wednesday early release around the workshop model, which are the reading workshop units of study that they've been doing. So we're actually creating workshops together with the teachers around their focused professional learning time. So once um, the students are released in service, that allows them a chance to work vertically um, and also across schools with people in similar areas that they're gonna continue to progress and grow in their professional learning. So, for example, coming up on this coming Wednesday, teachers actually selected based on their previous experience, their previous training, their current priorities areas within the classroom where they felt they had the best potential to grow and they self-selected different workshops that they'll actually be attending and they're working collaboratively with each other and with the instructional leadership in our district um, to attend professional learning so that they can continue to grow in this methodology that we're implementing um, across our levels. So that happens not only in the elementary but also on those early release days that vertical teams get a chance to connect, you know, your elementary PE teachers, middle school, high school, um, nurses, special ed. So those Wednesdays really give us a chance to get down to the nuts and bolts of our curriculum and ensure that we're really working and building and rowing in the same directions. And then an example of an after school showcase school based meeting. Um, I would say that uh, there's been some really good work done at all the schools in that and that can be um, staff meeting time, that could be after school meeting time. Um, I've worked really closely with Kate Boyton at the high school and she really, uh, we've used that time to really start looking at differentiation models using the landmark outreach that we've been working with, Adam Hickey this year, um, and she has a cohort ready to, you know, working on that. Um, and then, for instance, yesterday we spent some showcase time looking at the NEASC report and really unpacking it and saying what does this report tell us about Reading High School and how can we, you know, best uh, work towards some of the goals that they outlined for us. And so we also, uh, Heather and I have had the opportunity to uh, <coughs> participate in the four different DESE networking groups, which puts us together uh, for our own professional learning with our job alike colleagues from districts across the state. So they have groups for the different content areas, uh, literacy, social studies, science and math happening right now. So it's a really great way for us to hear about what's going on in other districts, bring back new ideas to calibrate what we're doing. Uh, so it's been really great for us to participate in those this year, especially uh, with these new roles. And I use as an example outside school hours that um, we're offering our second round of sheltered English immersion courses, um, which is done through um, 
We are actually working with SEAM on that, but that is a requirement for teachers who are core subject teachers that have had an English language student in their class or may have an English language st student in their class. Um, and it's a pretty rigorous class, it's 12 weeks. Um, so we've coordinated that, we've actually housed it here in Reading to make it more convenient for our staff to attend. Um, in addition, we are starting to offer, um, and I'm gonna talk about that on another slide too, but some SEI um, courses that are for recertification. The new DESE regulations require that teachers have to have 15 hours of special ed specific professional development and 15 hours of sheltered English specific professional development. So we're offering those in-house um, just to make it easy and also to really help design that so that they're programs that meet our goals as well. So towards that end, um, kind of our big push of professional development, we're uh, branding it and framing our thinking of professional learning, and I've, I've called it the Reading Institute. So we are going to have seasonal Reading Institute installments. Uh, this is brand new this year. Um, I talked a little bit about it last at the last school committee meeting because our Reading Institute um, spring edition is on March 22nd and that will be an equity and diversity day and I actually have flyers they didn't make it into the school committee packet but um, can you pass those out to school committee members um, and the flyers are just save the date we're gonna put that on our website this day will be for our staff all of our teachers and our professional staff, as well as um, anybody else in the staff, paras, um, st secretaries, administrative assistants, anybody who would like to come. Um, and we have a full package of workshops, a keynote, a mini keynote, all about equity and diversity and inclusion. Um, our summer institute, the Reading Institute Summer, um, we are really just starting to plan that we're going to have some of the courses that we're working on some of the strategic goals like reading workshop um, we will definitely have some sheltered English courses um, we will definitely have some differentiation courses we'll probably offer some of the Le Leslie trauma courses that we've um, offered already this year um, and we'll re resend those but we're really trying to focus on the week of June 24th to 28th hopefully with no snow days we'll have um, teachers before they sort of unplug and get away we're going to offer that and what's really exciting about that is that we have partnered with Gordon College so that any of our Reading Institute classes that we run are eligible for graduate credits so if it's a 15-hour course that would be one graduate credit um, and we're also pro hopefully planning at least one two two credit course our ultimate goal would be to have even three three credit courses um, but we're in the beginning stages of planning that and we actually have reached out to teachers in district if they'd like to co-teach with some of us or some of our team or some of the principals have offered uh, to share their expertise we have some really talented um, professionals in our uh, district that are adjuncts in other uh, colleges and institutions and uh, we're pretty excited about it um, so let's see Oh, fall 2019, obviously we have our election day, professional development day, um, and we're just starting to plan for that. So that'll be our Reading Institute fall edition, um, and also new teacher induction, which will happen at the end of the summer, will be the Reading Institute summer. Okay. What, Chris, what's sheltered English? So that's the state um, terminology for it. It's really just English language learners, uh, people who work with students who, um, English is new to them. So that's the term they use, sheltered English. Thank you. So you'll see a lot of, if you look on any state site, it says SEI, that's what that means, sheltered English immersion. That um, basically it means a class where we're teaching English, but it's, it's not for foreign, you know, we're, we're teaching it in the regular program. Right. So English is being taught in a sheltered environment in this classroom. So there's our, um, our website and our uh, Twitter handles we tweet a lot the three of us and um, we do it on purpose and we do it because we want everyone in Reading to see the things that are going on in our district anytime we go to workshops anytime we can we try to 
bring our phones and we try to take pictures and really give a snap snapshot of all of the great things that are going on pre-K to 12 in Reading. So if you haven't already followed us on Twitter, please do so. Our Twitter handles are on the learning and teaching page. Um, and especially school committee members, if you really want to see what we're doing every day, <coughs> Uh, we typically tweet several times a day, but definitely um, prolifically weekly. Um, and then we also have a link to our website. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the committee? Ms. Borowski. Great. Um, so, thank you. That was a great presentation and great to hear all the good work that's happening. I have a question about the development of sort of curriculum maps. If I'm using that term. It seems to me largely driven by the state grant. She's never talking. You would expect. Oh, Jeannie, oh, can you sorry. My, <laughs> the mic's closer. Um, our old room was much smaller. Yeah. The project is fine. Um, so my question is, could you give me a sense of how much of the curriculum maps that you have developed and are developing are driven by the state frameworks? And how much might be more organically reading? If, if anything, is, it, is yeah. it all just translating the state frameworks? Or is there an opportunity to say, you know, in our community, we do this in third grade, and it may not be the state framework, but that is what we do. That mm -hmm. is an awesome question. So I'll say they're all driven by the frameworks because that's our job, yeah. right? Um, however, I think the curriculum maps live in between. If you read the frameworks, they're huge, they're global, and we could all read them and come up with a completely definition of what does that look like and what would that sound like. So then you take it down to a day-to-day -day classroom teacher's level, and I'm individually planning lessons to teach my students what they need, right? Curriculum maps live in the middle of that. So they're taking that really big global idea, um, and they're trying to provide structure, guidance, and some con levels of consistency to take it down so that when, as a teacher, I'm planning my individual lesson, I'm not by myself interpreting that huge state, state mm -hmm. framework. Mm -hmm. So it's providing us that, that structural sound understanding so that we can increase our understanding of what does that standard look like and sound like and how will I know if my kids have mastered it? So we're consistent so then that's when I can then layer on um, my capacity and interest of my teacher knowing the students in front of me, their needs and their interests to personalize it. So that, that curriculum map really kind of takes it from that, taking those big, big picture things and, and creates a layer of um, translation almost, but also structure so that we have a consistent structure, but it doesn't mean we're doing the same thing. And, and it has a, a, a reading flavor, oh. <laughs> depending, because we are, you know, we're, we have committees and we, have, we are the decision makers on what tools that we use, so that's where we bring our flavor. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. Yep. Um, I just would like to hear a little bit, um, clear, I really like that you I, were articulate that these need to be living, breathing documents because they really do. Like, mm -hmm. if you're doing it right, you're always revising them. So it's great to put that in this grade, we're going to do eight chapters of math until it, the teachers come up and say, absolutely impossible, it's a bad idea, we can't cover, you know, we can fly through it, but the kids aren't going to learn what they need to learn. Meanwhile, one of these sections really does fit better the following year. So what is the sort of systemic way that you have to hear back from the teachers who are in the classroom about where the maps are working and where they need adjustments? So I think that's, you know, that's, that's why we're, we're eager to get this work done, right? <laughs> because that's, in our, in our mind, that's the magical part, is to then say, okay, how can we support you? So you have a third grade class that isn't able, for whatever reason, this class can't power through you know, that math unit, then we can t look at our intervention models and say, how many kids in the class need intervention? We look at our staffing decisions at that point, and we really start tweaking that. But we also have to know exactly, as, as we have to be really clear about what we're expecting to be taught. I think, again, I think there is a lot of consistency in Reading, and I think a lot of teachers work really well with their grade level teams. They have grade level time in, in pre-K to eight, and then the high school have department meeting time. Um, but we're really trying to build a structure where it's memorialized and it's accessed regularly. So we're using common language, we're looking at the vertical alignment, oh wait, we're missing this, oh we should really have that in. So I think that that's the goal and that's part of why there's an aggressive timeline in, on the, these things. Mr. Robinson. So I just have a, a, just a process question. You may have answered it as we went over a lot. So what we're, I, I look, we're looking at two things. Uh, curriculum guides, which I'll call the brochure about what we do, and then the curriculum ma maps, yeah. which are the important, you know, uh, uh, road map for the teachers to mm -hmm. follow. And uh, I guess I miss, I was just trying to understand is, 
are those, do those come out simultaneously or or because I I hear from the pub we hear from the public a lot of that they want to see the maps right so, so the teacher we look at the maps as more like a teacher tool and that and they should be li living breathing documents that are constantly evolving our goal was to get the guides out so that folks could say oh I mean most parents don't go on the DESE website and look up the frameworks and then try to interpret them and understand them they're really hard even for teachers they're written in very very dense language so that's really what we're attempting to do is take those frameworks and say this is what fourth grade science looks like but then what are the tools that we use in writing what are the supplies we have what are the budget allocations do we have enough things that's where that K to 2 science stuff came from this year I talked about that earlier this year that you know we have a lot of things going on and and when uh, at the beginning of the year Heather came to me and said Chris we need more K to 2 science things we're hearing from teachers that they don't have enough they know what the standards are they know what the frameworks are but they they can't be running out to CVS to buy things you know we need to have them readily available and I think there was there was no systemic way to do that so teachers were like okay I know I need to teach this but how do I do that so we couldn't wait on that that was something that had to be done immediately and luckily Heather put that together we got the some training in and we got that in the classroom and and now we're, that's part of what we're gonna do um, and that's part of our decision making at a teacher base level of what does that look like there are these units in science in grade two and what does that look like thank you Ms. Gordon. so the the document we saw in the earlier slide um, you had like a s screenshot What's of two of them this one that, this one yes. no, no before that no. so that that's what Chuck's calling the brochure the, the guides. That's the guides. The guides. They're the and curriculum guides. The curriculum guides. And then what's the most useful document? This this document or the, the map for a parent? So I think for a parent, this is, because okay. this is what we're expecting to be taught. This okay. is what second grade, what does that say? Grade two, grade one. Yeah. Grade, grade one. one. This is what it looks like in a nutshell. Yeah. This is exactly, your child will at least learn this. Okay. <laughs> so, so it'll be written in an accessible way for someone who doesn't understand the the terms that are common in education. So the, the, the second question I had is a different one. Um, the accessing of the curriculum across time. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes we have presentations that talk about how the curriculum is structured from the standpoint of not what's in each class or each grade level, but how do students move between grade levels and classes per subject, right? Mm -hmm. So you might go from you know, if you take this class in ninth grade, you have access to these electives, mm -hmm. um, and you could take those in 10th or 11th grade, right? That kind of, and I don't know, what, what do you call that? They call them pathways in the, uh, p the uh, program, you know, the program of studies. So, high so middle school and high school pathways, mm -hmm. where do parents get those? So um, the, the high school ones are right in the program of studies, which is okay. readily available. Uh, I actually don't know the answer to the middle school one, but I, I will definitely. particularly eighth to ninth. Yep. The right. middle school, there isn't. They're on the, the middle school, pretty much they take the same courses because they're right. on the same, they're all the but, same. But team. going from eighth, so for example, if a student was in you know, a certain eighth grade class going mm -hmm. to the comparable class in high school, if they're you know, in, I guess, so some classes we've combined CP and SCP, what used to be called CP with SCP, and others we haven't. Right. And then, as a, so if a student is in, in some subjects they might be in CP or SCP, and then there's honors, and then in other subjects there's just, you know, two options, not three that I just described. And then let's say you're in a co, you know, combined SCP class, <coughs> and you want to take honors the next year in right. that subject. Can you do that? Like. How do parents get those questions answered? So those are all in the program of studies for the high school. Okay. It's clearly outlined. Um, and I know Kate and, and, and I, again, new to the process, uh, we're gonna con continuously look at that and really our, both of us have a philosophy of opening as much as we can to as many students as, as we can. So we're definitely gonna be looking at that. Okay. But yeah, they're all there, and, and there are, they even have like optional pathways. And, and we like update that. that as the. It just, it, well, the students that had to year. pick their courses, which are already it due, has to be done it was year. already out. It's yeah. annual. Good. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And of course, guidance is a huge part of that for students yeah. at the high school. Yeah. So, take a couple questions from the community. Um, so can you, can you, Mrs., you need to come up to the mic. 
Well, RCTV people think. Hi, Mary Ann Downing, 13 Heather Drive. So I hate to belabor the maps question, but I just want to follow up so I understand. All teachers work from the same map. Yes. Like not saying, you know, teacher A can use this poem, teacher B can use that poem, but per the map, we're, we're all going to get to like multiplying fractions by yeah. the end. So I guess I think when Mr. Bobbin was asking about teacher A getting through five chapters and teacher B getting through ten chapters, when you see data like, um, you know, Parker eighth graders scoring 65% proficient on um, MCAS math and Coolidge scoring 83%, would a map solve that problem? Would a map address, well, gee, Coolidge got through more content than Parker, and is that the goal of? So uh, to answer that question, I, I, I think yes and no. Um, I think that, yeah, it's not just that. I think that the pacing guides that are part of the maps, which are part of our teacher tools, will definitely help with that. But again, we're dealing with students, individual students with the individual needs. So it's not always we didn't get to it. It might be that those students didn't master that for whatever reason. I, I don't have. Yeah, I just say when yeah. it's in the aggregate, when it's right. the entire grade. And the other quick question was just on high school, where you're talking about they're starting the mapping process. Is it going to differentiate between honors and SCP? So honors class covers this much material, and that's their curriculum guide, mm -hmm. and SC, it'll be leveled? So. Some of the subjects are leveling theirs right now, and some of them are still developing the different levels. They're saying, like, overall, U.S. history will look like this in this grade. But we're, we're working on that. But, like, I know some of the subjects absolutely have a different guide depending on what level. <coughs> Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Mr. Wise. Uh, Tom Wise, 181 South Street. Um, First of all, I want to say thank you. <laughs> um, a lot of us have been asking for these guides for quite some time, and you ladies turned it out really quickly. So thank you, you first of all. Um, second thing I was wondering is, um, as, we, as we look at um, historical trends, right? Um, and Mr. Bobbin kind of hit on it, and Marianne kind of hit on it. But even before that, when we rolled out Math in Focus, we pr arguably probably didn't prepare our teachers appropriately. Um, so having this now helps with that. But we're going forward into a new social studies curriculum, mm -hmm. and you guys, ladies, are working on that already. That's yeah. great to see. Um, can you forecast that you'll be ready and the teachers will be ready for the new civics course? come this time, next, I mean, come September of next year, such that we don't run into a thing like we run into with Math and Focus? Do you want to answer? Yeah. Well, the civics course, um, we're going to be developing all throughout next year. So the state has given us till the end two years, two years to fully implement the 2018 framework. So um, do we anticipate being ready? Absolutely, yes. Uh, but it won't be in September, but um, the following September, uh, September 2020, we hope to have everything in place, and that's why our committee that we mentioned earlier will be meeting all throughout the rest of this year, probably in the summer. Um, and Chris and I are collaborating with multiple districts around because we're all in the same boat on this one, uh, and we're working together with surrounding districts to, um, to support each other in creating this basically entirely new eighth grade course. Thank so Mr. You. Wise, as far as like moving forward, how we roll out things, I think we have a, we have a really strong department. I, th I hope you can see that. Um, teacher training is integral to that. And I think, I can't talk what's, about what's been done in the past. I can only talk about since I've been here and moving forward. Um, I am a teacher at heart. The, my team are teachers at heart. We don't want teachers to be standing in front of kids not feeling confident about what they're doing. So as we roll out anything, or even as we tweak things, we're constantly gonna be working with them about this is what this looks like. I'll give you that example of the K-2 to science kits that um, Heather put together. She, before she even gave out the kits, she brought every single teacher to the table and said, this is what's in the kit, this is how you use it, these are the standards and addresses. So she literally did a lab 
lesson with them and then went back and, and reviewed it as needed. Um, we don't want teachers to feel like they're kind of um, winging this. We're not winging it, and I don't think that's been done in the past. I think that um, we're really lucky that we have a team of, of strong teachers here. Um, and, and our district has strong teachers. This um, social studies team, we have all middle school staff on it. The people that are helping us to write the curriculum are actually teaching the curriculum. And the people that are helping map the math are actually teaching the math. So it's not us sitting in a room and just kind of you know, giggling and, and figuring out what we're going to do. We're actually working with well, the we teachers. Do we do <laughs> giggle a lot. Um, yeah, we're, we have a lot of fun too. But, um, but you know, I think this is a joy. This is joyful work. So we're excited about that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, well, Another question? One more question. we can make it quick because we're 45 minutes behind. I know there's people in the back, sort of waiting All for the right, next we'll time. Go ahead. I'll, okay. I can take it offline. Okay. Thank you. You can always send me an email too. Um, right, thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you. Arthur. We'll move on to um, our old business uh, item of the FY1920 kindergarten update, Dr. Doherty. And we have an update in our packet that does include a curriculum update, by the way, on the back of the technology systems update. Hey, uh, not curriculum, enrollment. Thank Dr. you. Doherty. So in your, in your packet, there are two documents for this agenda item. One is um, a memo that uh, dated February 7th that outlines the whole process, which I'll get into in a minute, on the kindergarten assignments for the 1920 school year. The letters are being sent out, and so families should have those letters um, either Saturday or Monday at the latest. Um, on what their school and program assignments are gonna be. So I'll get into that in more detail. The other document that you have is the projected enrollment as of this moment um, with the, um, the traditional uh, setups that, that I've outlined in the memo where we have half day uh, programs at Joshua Eaton and Killam and then full day programs at all five elementary schools. So just to go back a little bit into history, um, June 4th of last year, <laughs> I know Nick asked that question uh, to me offline. <coughs> June 4th of last year, I presented to the committee um, the priorities for kindergarten and how we would establish moving forward. And those five uh, priorities in order were access to full-day kindergarten, who families who want that option, uh, maintaining adequate class sizes um, in K-2, to keeping half and full day classes separate and not integrated, keeping siblings in the same school if it is in a half day program, and maintaining neighborhood schools. Those were the five priorities that were outlined in that June 4th presentation, and I believe we revisited uh, those in the fall you before did. we mm -hmm. went forward uh, knowing what the, the registrations were. So when we were uh, coming up with this year's kindergarten uh, program assignments, we were coming off of uh, this current year, which now in grade one, uh, assuming, you know, projecting students also coming back from private kindergarten, we're going to hit 339. And if you notice in the enrollment chart, 339 would be the largest grade at the elementary level next year, if those numbers hold. Um, next year's kindergarten, we have 320 registrations right now. Um, it's seven months from the start of school. So it is possible that we will, we may hit 330 um, in, in kindergarten. Uh, you know, a lot of things can happen in seven months. So that is back-to-back -back years of larger kindergarten grades coming off of back-to-back -back years in grades two and three of next year of smaller kindergarten years. So when you had the smaller kindergarten years, that freed up classroom space, now you combine that with back-to-back -back larger classroom, uh, larger kindergarten years, now those classes get uh, taken, taken up again. So that's part of the challenge that, that we're facing. Um, as I said a year ago, um, 
and I would continue to say it, and, uh, you know, the integrated program is not the preferred model. Um, it's something that we've had to do uh, because of space and resource constraints over, over the years. But it is not the preferred kindergarten model. Um, and you heard that loud and clear last year from the, uh, the teachers who wrote a letter to this committee. Um, so it always is our goal to try to have a traditional full and half day setup. And we're finding more and more, and I think right now you see we have 28 students that are registered for half day for next year. Um, and as you saw in a previous enrollment chart, those students are spread out over five schools. So you really can't have a separate half day program in all five schools because of the small numbers. Um, so those are some of the challenges that, that we have been facing as we've come up with this. So when in, on January 28th, when I uh, told the committee that we were going to have to go to an integrated model, we also uh, were going on the assumptions at the time that we only had one classroom available in the district for half day, and that was Killam. Um, so when we re received, obviously, in the, and you'll see in this packet, there were a lot of emails from parents, uh, which we did do our best to respond to every single one of them, um, that, that wanted us to reanalyze and reconsider uh, the integrated model. So we spent, um, we've spent the last uh, week or so, uh, 10 days, taking a look at what we could do. Um, through discussions with the building principals, through discussion with central office administrators, uh, Kelly Boswick, Rice Preschool Director, uh, we were able to identify a classroom at Joshua Eaton for uh, next year as well. That is coming, and I'm going to men mention later the limitations of the plan that, that I've put forward. By, uh, by having an available classroom at Joshua Eaton next year and at Killam, it now makes the ability to have half-day classes a little bit more uh, palatable because now you've got two different locations for classrooms um, because transportation becomes a big factor when you only have one space. So um, I also want to caution the committee that you know this is based on what we know right now. We've got seven months left. Um, and so everything we're saying right now is based on the numbers that we have today, and we don't know what's going to happen over the next seven months. So I just, I want to, I know I may sound like a broken record by saying that, but that is, that is the reality when we have the constraints that we have. So essentially what's going to be happening now um, is that all, we'll have full-day programs at all five elementary schools. As I mentioned earlier, the half-day programs will be at Joshua Eaton and Killam. Uh, Barrows and Joshua Eaton half day will be going uh, to Joshua Eaton and um, Wood End, Birch Meadow and Killam half day students will be assigned <coughs> to Killam. We will be starting those half day classes with the first bell at 8.05. Uh, that allows families and we, do, we are currently doing this now uh, at Killam. It, it allows those families that may have uh, students in two elementary schools the ability um, to be able to um, go between schools. Um, the Birch Meadow and Wood End students, we do have students that live beyond two miles from Killam, uh, from their assigned school at Killam, so <coughs> we are going to provide uh, access to busing at no additional cost if they, if they choose that option. We are not going to be able to provide busing for students that live under two miles, and I'm going to explain the challenges that we have with the transportation, because the transportation is a big part of this. Because um, as we mentioned in the last meeting, um, to add a bus would cost $65,000, which essentially is a teacher. Um, so I'll get into more of that in, in a deep. Just before you um, keep going on the uh, limitations, I just want to make sure that the, explain for the committee that even prior to January 28th, doc, I worked very closely with Dr. Darby. Um, we, we thought, you know, we have one classroom. Um, went back, Dr. Darty went with his team, and I was 
um, part of a lot of those discussions as that was unfolding, and the um, the ability to sort of create the opportunity for a classroom had some um, put put some risks in place. And I really wanted to make sure. So as Dr. Darty was preparing this for the committee, it was very important to me that we make sure that that. Um, the information that he's about to go over, you know, what were the limitations and of the plan were really important. Now, this was not the letter that was um, certainly sent out to the kindergarten families, um, was more focused on, you know, this is what the program is going to be and this is, um, you know, where the students are going to be, um, be assigned out of attendance areas. So I just want to make sure the committee is aware that there was a tremendous amount of work and I felt it was really important that we capture you know, all of the things that sort of went into creating that opportunity. I also, um, I also do feel like, and I, um, when we get to the agenda at the end, we, we had last year talked about looking at our attendance policy, JC, and it is something that we will, will do, um, I've tried to work into the schedule. Um, just because as I look at the priorities, I think it's, it's clear that um, educationally, um, from our administrators, our teachers, and also from the, our community, the um, being able to have the full day and half day classes separate is is sort of the second priority. We had all agreed, and I think from our educators that full day kindergarten is the is what we would like all of our students to be in, right? So I think it is. Again, we will have a follow up discussion on that policy, and um, but I just wanted to make sure that the committee was aware that thought it was really important to make sure that we, we all understood clearly what helped to create this opportunity. So, Dr. Darty. Thank you. So, the, um, I, I want to walk you through the steps of the different limitations so that you're aware, and I know it's all outlined in the memo, but I think it's important also to, to, to discuss it as well. So, first, the, the way we were able to free up the classroom at Joshua Eaton, it really was twofold. One is, which I had mentioned, um, at a previous meeting is that we did collapse the grade four classes from next year from four to three. And if you look at the class sizes, that falls within the guidelines, allows us to do that. That classroom was actually being earmarked for RISE because we had to eliminate the classroom at Killam, <coughs> which is a RISE classroom this year. We have a RISE classroom at Killam this year, and I needed that classroom back at Killam for K to five purposes, um, we were actually earmarking that class at Rise um, for uh, at Joshua Eaton for Rise. Um, in discussions that I had with Kelly Boswick over the last week, um, what we're going to do is we're going to have two half day sessions share a classroom. So we'll have a morning session and an afternoon session share a classroom. Um, so that's how we're going to be able to go from nine to eight with rise classrooms. So I want to put that, that's one of the limitations. If for some reason I'm going to need additional rise preschool space at this point, I don't have another classroom to be able to do that. And I'll have to look at other alternatives. So that, that's one piece that is, is, is a limitation. Um, another limitation is transportation. So the way that uh, buses work is that when you um, contract out for a bus you are actually contracting out for three routes with that bus. Um, the, current, the current setup for the routes is the high school route is first followed by the middle school route and then the elementary route. The elementary route in this case is Killam. Uh, we have two buses so we have two buses that have each three routes. Um, next year we are going to be actually changing the order of the routes for two reasons. One is because of the transportation needed now for Killam, but also uh, because of the high school late start, because that plays into this now. So uh, what we're going to be doing is we're doing the middle school route first, followed by the elementary route, then the high school route last. In order for, to make this work, because the elementary route is now going to be a longer route, because one of the routes, uh, actually both of the routes, are going to have to pick up students in the Birch Meadow and Wood End district, um, whereas right now they do not. 
um, is we're going to have to start the, two, the middle school buses at 6.30. Um, they currently start at around quarter of seven. So the two middle school bus routes, which are now the first routes, will be starting at uh, 6.30. That gets them to the middle schools at 7 o'clock, um, which now the question begs, who's going to supervise those students? Because you need to have supervision for when those students get off the bus. So uh, in conversations that I had with the two middle school principals, they felt like they could have supervision available at 7 o'clock in the morning for those students. So the, the middle school bus would drop off the students around 7 o'clock. Um, they would then go and pick up elementary students. The elementary students would be getting to kill them at approximately 7.30, 7.35. Um, the next question that would be asked is, are we going to have supervision for the elementary students? Because that would be about 15 minutes earlier than right now. And talking with Sarah Levesque, she felt like we, they could readjust schedules to make that happen. So that now means that your next routes are the high school, and um, the high school routes, they'll be getting there about 8.20, 8.25, just before the 8.30 start time for high school. So in a perfect world, this is going to work. Um, you know, given the information that we have right now and the students that we anticipate will be on the buses. It also means, though, there will be some students at the elementary level that will be on a bus for 45 to 55 minutes because the elementary routes are now longer. Okay? So that's the transportation piece, which is obviously, um, you know, a little bit of a limitation. The other piece now is because we are splitting the position that was originally for Killam into two buildings now, um, we actually need a little bit more FTE because we have to provide the necessary contractual planning time for each of the .6 teachers. So we had a 1.0 assigned to Killam. Um, we now have to split that because we have two classrooms. Uh, two half-day sessions, so we are actually going to need a 1.2 because you need 0.6 in each building for the contractual planning time. So we are going to need an additional 0.2 kindergarten teacher um, with the current numbers that we have. Now, if for some reason, and I'm, I'm going to refer you now to the elementary enrollment chart, you'll notice that right now Killam is at 19 for half-day. If for some reason those half-day numbers go up, and then we need to have a second session, which would be the afternoon, we will need an additional 0.4 FTE at Killam to make it a 1.0 teacher, because then we will have a morning session and an afternoon session. Um, again, I, we don't know yet if that's going to happen, because we've got seven months. But that is a possible limitation that we're going we're gonna to face. Um, and then the other piece is class size, and you know, uh, I, I empathize with the parents that came up earlier and talked about the class sizes, and I fully understand their concerns. Um, we do right now have class sizes at Killam for next year in the kindergarten at 23 um, with, this, with this plan. So that's the limitations with going to this model for next year. Um, as you heard from Mrs. Dowd earlier, uh, we do have the elementary space planning and enrollment study that's going on. It will not solve the problem for next year. It will not solve the problem for two years from now. It will give us the information that we need to move forward um, as to what is going to be the best solution uh, for the Reading Public Schools over the next several years. Um, and, but that's a long-term solution at this point. Mr. Robinson. I just had a question. Maybe it's for Linda or Dr. Darty. Do we have a, I mean, we must have a historical perspective as to what now we're mid-February. Mid how many more sign-ups do we usually get? Uh, yep. Uh, um, I would, it's possible we could get 10 to 15 more okay. students in kindergarten. And it's possible. Some years it's less, so but it's possible. So do we uh, ever, like, with uh, sign up, I, I think one, I mean, we probably maybe have to use spot districting at this point going forward now or getting close to that point. 
uh, where, or do we say, you know, or as a committee, do we shut off the full day signups at this point and, and anyone that signs up after a certain date is only signing up for half day? Right now, everyone that's, that's signing up is half day. If they want full day, they're put on a waiting list, but they're in half day right so, now. So then, then if you get 10 more half day, we should be able to accommodate them. Uh, you've only got what nine? No, not if they go to not if they're in the Birch Meadow Wood End kill them district. No, I'm you saying can, you'd have to make a superintendent not put them in. Can't you put them in a? But in if a, they're over two miles, then I have to bus them. That's that's the challenge. Well, I mean, you know. Well, it it it, it would be complicated to to figure out depending to, upon yeah. right where the students I, I'm are just, I, and. I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm just explaining to the committee, here are all the things that could happen. I'm not saying they're going to happen, but I, I want to make the committee aware of what could happen. Because it has happened in the past. Well, I guess then we would need to have a discussion as a committee if we get to that point where we're in a situation where there's, there's students that are over the two miles is it or it's two, two miles two yes. miles then what what do we do we can't then revert back to to integrated i mean we got to figure out a, a way to handle that i guess that's, that's right that's, so uh dr doherty should be figure that out within this limits i wouldn't expect that, yeah that I, they I, would I'm, go back that you would be placing any we will do our very that. best to make all of this work i just i felt that i needed to inform the committee of what the different challenges were moving forward thank you mr boyd yeah so everyone that requested full day this year up to what point received full day or did everybody who requested full day Get full day in this up to this point, everyone that has requested full day has received which, full which day. Which has always been our so for this year. Anyone who wanted to sign up for full day and admittedly pay for it, but the, everybody this year has. Full yeah, day? the vast majority were registered before the deadline. Okay, so everyone registered before the deadline got full day this year. Yep, everyone registered before the deadline for FY what was this twenty got full day. Yes. That's right. yes. Yes. So that yes. that is the number one priority that this committee <coughs> and the superintendent agreed on. So, um, just want to make that clear. That's that's the priority. The um, whether it's integrated or traditional is not the number one priority, right? So we could have you know you you've laid out very nicely for next year how traditional and not integrated instruction will be delivered to all of these students in kindergarten, but in FY21 under the current policy it could go back to a different. Arrangement. You could have integrated again, depending on the numbers. Correct. If we keep the priorities, uh, depending where on the space so available. It's not a and, policy. Yeah. It was guidance. Well, so. it, uh, thank you. But uh, yeah. the priorities, I should have said. So I just want to make that clear that 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 is the system we have. The the priority is to give everybody who requests full day by the deadline full day. It is not to ensure that everybody gets traditional instruction, meaning not integrated. That is correct. That is how we're operating. Correct. So, Correct. There's, it is it is a flexible excuse system me. that allows you, for that first. Can you priority. guys, Marianne? Excuse me. Can you? Okay. So so within that, the, tell me more about this 45 minute bus ride. How many students are affected by that? Because that really got my attention. That mm -hmm. you're estimating you we could have, and is that a kindergarten child? Is that any child between K through six? Like, wh how old are the kids on these 45 minute bus rides? Well, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be it it wouldn't be sixth grade. Because that's a different five. bus. K through five. Thank It'd you. be K through five. Um, it, it's possible it, it could be it could be younger students. Yes. All right. But again, some of this uh, we we have not reached out to these families. We are looking strictly by the mileage that these families live right. from the school, and we're going under the assumption that they're going to take the bus. We, and we have to legally provide yes, that we, opportunity. Right. They that's don't have right. to take it. That, then they don't have to take it as correct, right? But we shall provide. Right. I understand that. So that's what I'm basing this on right now. So that, that got my attention as a as a um, real consideration for, for me. If if that is something that a student is experiencing, I, I would be concerned about that. That's a long time to be on a bus in Reading, right, when you're going two miles. I understand right. the route may be that long. I know yeah. that as 
as Dr. Darty was working on this, Ms. Sporowski raised also raised that, that yeah. issue. But um, Dr. Doxer, my question was. Is it right to assume that once we have this plan in place, people will register for the bus so we'll know what stops there are going to be and that's going to impact... Oh, she's already got the bus. That's going to impact how long kids are on the bus because some people might say, I'm not oh. going yes. to take that bus. Mm -hmm. My kid is... I'm driving my child, so you don't have to stop on that street, which is going to make the route more succinct and less arduous. Yes, I, what I'm outlining for you is, uh, I don't wanna say worst case scenario because it's based on the kids that we know right now. Because if other kids move in yeah. that are further, then it would, but it's based on what we know right now. But and assuming kids, that they're taking it. Okay. But there'll be a chance for them to say, I'm not taking it, even though they can change their mind later. They can. I want to um, make sure that we get community questions in, so I'm gonna. I do want. I'm gonna filter them out. I know that the committee may still have more questions, but I do want to. In the sort of interested, if there's any questions from the community or any comments, I want to start to take them also. But I will. Mr. Boyden, did you have another question? I do. When you're ready, let's let other people talk. Uh, all right. We'll let uh, <laughs> Mrs. Williams, and then we'll, we'll sort of, so we'll sort, of, sort of go back and forth here, which. The quote, if you uh, fail to plan, you plan to fail, keeps coming to mind when we talk about kindergarten. This has been how many years, and I just can't come to any more meetings and watch this okay. circus. Mrs. Williams, I just, I want to say that everyone in this room has worked tremendously hard. I understand that. Well, I understand just, that. And always with the intent to do the right thing for students, to try to follow the priorities. So, and Dr. Doherty, and I together, as well as his staff, spent a lot of time trying to figure out how do we create an opportunity. Mr. Boyven pointed out that the policy has, the priorities have the um, traditional or not integrated as the third item. I recognize that in, in, in reality what we've done is made that the second most important um, item. That's what this plan does. The committee is going to address policy or the priorities and the, and the attendance policy um, probably this spring is the, is the guideline. But just the, these priorities to ensure and to the best extent possible provide full day uh, kindergarten experience for students and then make sure that it's a non-integrated <coughs> model if that's possible are, have, have basically been the two priorities. Um, and the class size with the exception of Killam we've done pretty well on the class size at this point. Which leads me to my, my next question. Why do we keep trying to cram sardines into a tin can? I don't, I don't understand it. We don't have the space. We are having parents hand over $4,500 to get into full day kindergarten for space that we don't have. We have now added or looking to add a 1.0 FTE. We are adding a bus. We are now this is now costing us money. We're not, not adding a, a bus, Mrs. Williams. It's okay, but it's, we have to add more time to the bus? Nope. No, we're not we adding a bus. Add. Okay. We've added an FTE. That costs yeah. us money. And no, I was, we haven't we added, added an FTE. Did I not and hear it, a 1.0 no. FTE? An additional We're adding point a 0. 0.2 FTE. Okay. If we, I, that was additional. if we got more kids and had to add the afternoon. Right. What I'm outlining are limitations that could happen. That's what, that's what I was explaining. It could happen. Okay. It, ha it hasn't happened. But to, to have the two half days, it required adding a point two FTE right. to, it, to ensure that the teachers have the planning time. You can't just have a point five, or they don't have the appropriate uh, Okay, I apologize time. for mishearing that. My question is, why do we keep trying to cram all these kids in? Why can we not limit it? I mean, we're, we're wasting no, I mean, do you all want to be sitting here talking about kindergarten? If we had just limited it, we would not be sitting here right now. We know how many kids we can fit. We know how many teachers we need. We know the space. We know the limitations. We're done. Conversation ends. I, so I would. I, I'm going to actually answer it. Okay. Okay. Because educationally, full day kindergarten is best for students. I, That's the and, bottom line. But, and they and have families, and families they in Reading want full day kindergarten. 
Yeah, that's they will go to the, the that's school. the bottom line. They will go to the purpose school. Alicia, they will go we, elsewhere. We've also said, and I think we heard it from the teachers last year as well. It's it's uh, for us. It's much better to have the kindergartners in our district because you just heard a presentation on curriculum and how we're aligning and taking the standards and doing the guides and doing the maps, and. It's, it's better for us and for the student, we believe, for them to go to kindergarten in this but district. We would like to have everyone in our district because it helps the transition to first grade. But you're pitting half-day parents against full-day parents, whether you like it or not. It's well, an unfortunate side effect of all of this, and if we just had limitations, it wouldn't happen. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. I'm gonna, Mr. Boyvin had a question, and then we'll go back. So this point to kindergarten teacher I'm on the back of the memo second to last bullet point yes he added let's point to FTE which could come from a lot of different places Gail can we increase the offset for kindergarten because of that mm. it's more time it's more teacher no time. no it, what we're gonna have to do at this point is we're going to have to hire a teacher at a lower salary no understood that so so we're gonna use the, the, well, the available understood part. yeah understood but what the question we will is do if, is reassess the split between full day and half day to look at in the salaries and everything else. I, if anything, it would probably be a small, small increment change. to it yeah. because we did increase the offset as it was and we're sort of at that upper limit. So that is something we would consider when we look at where all the final numbers yeah, and the, next year. The, th the thingy being, yeah, the offset only applies to the full day full portion. Day full day portion piece, right. right. So and that's I where I, I need to make sure yeah. I look at where this FTE this is going if it's full day or half day. If it's half day, it's I, half day. I cannot. Yeah, it's going to half day. That's why. Mm -hmm. right. so but we're, we're gonna. Know. What we're gonna. We know what we have budgeted. That's what we're gonna have to budget at. More wear and tear in the classroom. Mm -hmm. But this is a. It's a change to a half day. There's more kids in the class. So this one from it, nine to. It's a, it's a half day a half position. Day position. It's not a full day not position. They're paying into the revolving account, so I cannot take money from someone paying for full day to go to a okay. half day. There were were there some that came off the waiting list, or you know they maybe it they, still doesn't. It still not. It, it can't. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> just take. I just thought I'd take a look at it. That's all. Good member of the community. Please excuse my voice. I lost it. <laughs> Um, Kristen Lachance, 341 Haven Street. Um, so I have a, I've lived in Reading my whole life. I live in the house that my parents grew up in, um, or my parents, my mom. Um, so my kids will be going to, hopefully going to kill them, <laughs> the same school I went to. Um, so I'm just trying to understand all of this because my son will start kindergarten in the fall. Um, and I came to the meeting and everything to kind of understand what was going on. Um, there was no mention of integrating um, and so obviously this was a big concern when this all came up and you know now we've come back I'm I'm concerned is this something that you're gonna go back on if we get more kids like is this gonna be something that could change no again no not, this year. not for next not year not, no. not for this coming year no we this is what we're doing okay um, yeah. and then so I, I guess uh, I just I mean, I have another son who's two. So what I what I don't understand is, we we know we don't have the space. We, I mean, we we pay a lot in taxes and still don't have free day, you know, free full day kindergarten. There's obviously a huge demand for free full day kindergarten, and then to have to possibly go to integrate it again in years to come. I mean, I, I for one don't have the option to do half day kindergarten because I work full day, and so does you know, so does my husband. So. But I don't understand why we should have to pay that kind of money if then, you know, my next son is going to have to be in, integrated with a half-day class and he's going to have to, you know, go through the curriculum in that short amount of time in the morning, which is not what I'm paying for and not what I asked for. Like, wh how, can, how can we be taking people's money for that? So this, the state, um, basically the state mandate is for it's communities for half to provide half-day. Mm -hmm. So there's no funding for the full day in this community. If we wanted to, uh, we would possible? need an override of, I believe, in the middle Again? about a million dollars. One point one million dollars. One point. Make it free. So, uh, can I just say this? This is you're you're sitting in a room with people that absolutely believe we should do this. And I know recently, Mrs. Borowski, we had a conversation, and she said, "I guess I have to finally 
you probably realize that at this point, the community is not likely, this community is not likely to support a $1.1 million override for full day K. The override that we just had, we, if you go all the way back to October, 6, October 2016, there were a lot of things that we needed. But even when we did the override, we didn't get the full amount of money for the things that we really felt we needed to do in this district. So it, you're right, that, that's, it's going to be a, a challenge. Um, but because the state, right, the state mandates half day, if you want full day, whether you pay for it in a public district or you go to a private placement, you, you, you have to pay for it. I, Which I, I, I used to think maybe the state will finally fund this, but, but I forgot there was a Chapter 70 um, legislative The, the state is not going not to. Not ever going to fund this. I had to give that up. Mrs. Borowski sort of, we both sort of realized we have to give those two imaginary pieces of thinking up and then that's why we will address the policy because clearly people, we believe in the full day kindergarten experience. We believe that it's best to have our children start their education here and we're gonna to have to figure it out. And yeah, the space, um, I can't go back in time and say, hey, don't sell Pearl Street School, <laughs> right? Like that, we, we, if we could do that, we, probably, we might not have this issue right now. I just but, feel like as a community, it's really tough, especially as a parent, like, uh, and now paying taxes in this town and everything that it, we have given so much money and I feel like we're never ever getting what we're actually giving this money for. Well, I think so I think that's why people don't want to pay for an override. It, 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 and it you can't a, really blame them. I think it's a this is a much bigger conversation as you can tell, but I think you're you're asking the question of will it change this year? No, because th we're not voting on this. This is this, this is a discussion. This, the superintendent was presenting this information with these considerations to the committee. Um, in terms of in terms of next year, I, I am going to work to lead the committee in, a, in a, the policy discussion where we will discuss these priorities and then you know, we'll know uh, uh, how those line up. That will inform how the superintendent approaches next year. It, in the end, you know, creating new space, whether creating new space that's even temporary is a challenge, but we'll, we'll look for every opportunity to, to, to uh, find the space. It may mean that classes are in spaces they haven't been before, and that's what we have to do until we can complete the elementary study. And, you know, and then as a community, there's a whole other discussion about what kind of capital you're gonna add to your school building. So Is it's there a, a big- Is reason that the study didn't happen sooner? The study, we, we funded the study um, a so few months ago. So in 2010, mm -hmm. I brought this problem forward to town meeting and to, this, to, to the school committee. We've been talking about this since 2010. Okay. In 2014, 13, 14, 14, 15, we were able to get six modular classrooms, mm -hmm. which has helped. It certainly has helped. So we, because of that, we were able to utilize the, the space. but. The space demands continue, and it's not just kindergarten that's creating the space. Right. Program. Uh, it, we have a lot of programmatic needs um, that are causing this. Well, are modulars possible and for coming years, or is that not even a discussion that's even being talked about? Like, I'm just wondering, just because I have, I'm going to have another kid that's coming through too, and this is like, I, I mean, I just. I, I think earlier in the meeting there was an update on capital, and um, Mrs. Dowd gave in her report an update on the elementary space planning study. I think there were some people here at the beginning of the meeting who are still here who gave some input, basically saying, you know, we've got some issues. Is can there be a shorter-term solution? I think it will. It will be a dialogue for us to to look at and consider. Um, I, there's not. There's nothing right now in a plan that says we have a short-term plan to put some short-term space in in place right now. We we hear it. We understand it. We've got some pinch points, and and. Um, you know, it doesn't, if there's an opportunity for us to resolve it without waiting until a final solution from a space planning study, then we're gonna look for those opportunities. Okay. So, Thanks. thank you. Is it, is it fair to say, this is a question for the superintendent, I mean, is it, is it fair to say that in exchange for not having a lottery that caps the number of full day slots and therefore giving everybody who signs up for full day access to full day, that given the space constraints, 
Um, we cannot guarantee integrated or traditional model. That becomes the wild card that flips every year depending right. on enrollment. Is that right. fair? Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. So you can either have a limit access to full day, not give it to everyone who requests it, or guarantee that there's no integrated classrooms. You know, one or the other, given the space constraints. Only one can be So we've, we've stated a priority that the priority is to get everybody who requests full day, full day. And that's what we've done. The cost of that is this flip-flopping potentially where we, we can't offer any kind of certainty around what that classroom environment is going to look like, whether it's going to be half day, full day, or full day, half day together in an integrated setting. We won't know until after everyone signs up every year. That's, That's where we are. Sorry, is that something you could, like, tell us about, feel about how they feel about I that? thought we just yeah, did. We, but. Yep. Uh, let me take Mr. Robinson's question. So uh, I just have a question for Dr. Doherty. Thank, thanks for this. I mean, there's a lot of detail in this memo. One of the things that maybe we reword because this becomes part of the record uh, some of these things are limitations that are known that we know some of these things are potential things that could happen and I think I'd rather see it like like if the comment sentence in there where it says if we have additional right well we don't know that now so that should be separated we know we know that there's a transportation limitation. That's a known, so that would stay there. But I think the rise comment and then the the comment down under the the uh, fourth bullet where we have if we receive additional, that's not a we. So that you you understand what I'm getting at? We we know what we should keep the known limitations together, and then the things that could potentially happen due to increased enrollment just for the for the record you're just sort of saying to maybe reorganize so that. reorganizing yeah that. i think the right yeah the rises mm -hmm. so it's something you can <coughs> refer to easier okay anybody else mr boyden sorry the or the other thing was the transportation um piece for parents that may have a student in half day at one school that is not their neighborhood school and another student in their family at their neighborhood school and right. elementary school. Um, are, does that situation exist? Are there sibling groups that are split that you know of? Yes. And oh, yeah. There are, there okay. are now. Yes. Year, there too. are now this year. And so that's why you have the earlier start time to allow parents to make a drop off mm -hmm. at one school at 8.05 a.m. and then go by, what is it, about 8.25? Uh, yeah, 8.25. We've, we've also provided uh, before school um, supervision uh, for the half-day students that had to travel. For free. Yeah, which we will continue to do. Okay. Dr. Doctor, Just really quickly, um, I'm, I have always fought against the idea of a lottery for the, the um, full-day kindergarten because, yes, I think that it's hard for full- and half-day families now. I think we can all make choices not to make it an issue between full- and half-day families. Um, but there would be an issue between those that get into the lottery and win their full day and those that really need the full day and don't win. So it's, you know, we can look at the grass being greener on the other side, but the reality is it, we are in this mess. And that is, I, I don't see one of those options as better than the other myself. I, I actually, I don't want to see the lottery. Um, and I think starting our kids in the schools now is more important um, and I just lost my second thought so I'm sorry yeah come on up. this is terrifying okay so <laughs> first I do want to say which I th I hope you guys all know but we do realize how impossible this is can you just At least did you state your name I'm sorry oh Emily Portillo uh, 59 Whittier Road thank you um, I do understand that this is an impossible decision. You guys are <laughs> gonna please somebody and upset somebody else. And I think that hasn't been said much. So I get it and I think a lot of us get it. It's just the frustration comes out. And I do think it could have been avoided based on how last year went if we had maybe planned for it. But I do get it, it's a lot. Um, I think as a community, it'd be good for parents and everybody to come together at this point and say, 
yes, I want what I want for my child, but I also don't want to mess up what you want for yours and kind of have that empathy between each other because I understand the issues with integrated. I understand that we've all determined that's not the ideal model, um, but I don't personally think displacing a child from their home school, whether or not they have siblings, really, I don't think it's appropriate, but especially when they have siblings, I don't think that should have even been on the table, personally. I just don't think it's really conducive to a good setup. Um, but I, I do hope there could be more respect between the two sides of it. Um, my son, I opted for half day at Birch Meadow. I have a third grader in Birch Meadow. Um, my son has grown up on that playground. My little one, he's there all the time. He sees his brother's friends. He knows the teachers. He helped in the library. He's gone to the community events. That's his school as far as he's concerned. So now to have to choose between what emotionally he has prepared himself for and is excited for and he loves that school, to have to choose between what's best for him emotionally and what's best for my family financially is a really impossible decision too. And I think you guys all sense that, that for the half-day parents, it's really rough, just like this is hard for you guys. Mm -hmm. um, my son is, will not cope well. I can't speak to other people's children. My son will not cope well transitioning to one school for kindergarten that he's unfamiliar with. No friendly faces, no teachers he's seen, no playground equipment he loves, um, and then transitioning back to another school the next year. I know some kids transition really well. Mine doesn't. <laughs> Uh, he's been going to the same preschool for three years, and there are still mornings when he says, Mom, you don't leave. You know, it's not, he's not that easygoing kid. It'll cause a lot of anxiety. And I know that integrated is not the perfect model academically, but you can set up the most perfect academic structure for the day for these kids. And if they're anxious, they're not going to learn anyway. My son's not going to absorb anything that he's being taught if the whole day he's anxious and uncomfortable and I just, I, I, of course the academics are important and I have so much faith in the educators that this district has chosen. I love every teacher I've met. They're all so more than competent and they're so passionate and they always wanna do what's best for the kids even when it's not the ideal situation. I spoke to, my son had a half day kindergarten program. He was lucky enough to have a dedicated one and the next year that teacher ended up teaching integrated and it wasn't her favorite. <laughs> I mean, they all expressed that, but she did such a good job. And I feel like until we fix the solution mm -hmm. or find the solution, displacing the kids isn't best. And I think developmentally they know that too. And it's just there between a rock and a hard place too. Integrated isn't great, but neither is uprooting a child's comfort, you know? Um, and I do have so much faith in our teachers. I think they could do it, even if they're gritting their teeth <laughs> through some of it, because it's not what they wanted. I think in future years, we could have the solution, whether it's modular classrooms or a lottery, even if that's not great. But I, I, my emphasis always, just for my family personally, is social emotional, because academic is so finite, and I can work with them on that. But social, emotional, if they don't have the environment that they feel safe and comfortable in, I can't fix that personally. I can't sit with them the extra hour at night and work on that homework. I can't, I can't rectify that. That's out of my control. So I, I don't have the solution. And it wouldn't matter if I did, because it's not my decision. But I think you're in a really hard position and I empathize with that. I just want to feel like half day needs, even if they are more social emotional, are being weighed the same as the academic needs of the integrated classroom because they're su both such important aspects of a schooling. And it seems like it's all academic right now. And it's just my personal stance, but I do always tend toward <coughs> emotional for my kids. Um, I know it's an unpopular opinion for the lottery going forward, and regardless, it's not an option for this year. So that's kind of something you guys have on your plates for next year. I, I get to opt out of that. <laughs> um, but this year, 
I don't want to be the person just adding to the complaints. I don't, <laughs> you guys have a lot of those, and I'm part of the complaints, but I've been thinking about it, and I, I wonder, I just, there are so many sympathetic people in the community, and I would wonder if it might be possible to reach out to parents if this is finite, if this is already decided that <coughs> there is no integrated and half day will only be at Kilim and Joshua Eaton. I can't change that. But there are seven months, and there would be an opportunity. If it were me and I were the full day parent, I might consider if I knew my neighbor's child wouldn't make it into my neighborhood school, <coughs> and this is a child that plays with them on the weekends, is, you know, I might personally consider saying, you know what, I'm okay with my kid going to integrated. And I don't know if some parents might opt for that if they were given the choice. If, if it were mapped out as, okay, integrated isn't ideal, but neither is displacing the children, are any of you okay with the model? And would you volunteer to have your children in an integrated classroom? Because I know full day is best, but half day, integrated is half day with some review. And if half day is being offered as an option, it's not completely dysfunctional, you know? So I don't know if that would be an option. I don't know if it would be an option to reach out to parents and say, does anybody, if they have the guarantee that should it not work out, they retain their full day place, would anybody opt to bump down to half day if that would create a, a, a standalone half day class in your neighborhood school? I don't know if any of these options are on the table. I'd be happy to help write letters. <laughs> I, I, I really appreciate how you spoke, and I think it's it's really important. And I, I do, um, I don't, I don't follow the Facebook. Um, I, I, I'm not on it. So I I'm understand that there was some it, that it, it it was it was not sympathetic and empathetic at some points over the last week or so um, on this issue. So I think you're making a really good point for our community. Um, I think the, I know it seems like we have seven months, couldn't we figure this out? But you really have to draw that line and say this is how we will go forward. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that's where we are now. Um, clearly it's, this is, and you recognize it's difficult all around. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, um, you know, maybe there's a there's a long-term solution that would allow us to do this seamlessly, but we're not anywhere near that that spot because we have to get the planning done and and see what we need to do with school capacity long term. Um, so I think you know, unfortunately, uh, th this is this is how we step forward. Um, I don't, you know, I understand. You, could you possibly reach out, but. I think the reality of getting an entire classroom and trying to change that, it's just not, you know, I don't think it's something that we can actually feasibly do. And there were certainly a good number of, um, you know, people in emails that said, this is the model we want, and you all know this is best for kids educationally. Um, and that's not to downplay at all with the social emotional needs um, and, you know, how difficult um, transitioning to school can be. Um, but I think this is where we are at this point. Um, Mr. Boylan. Thank you for you know, the, these, these um, types of, you know, taking the time to come and give us perspective and these types of um, you know, the perspectives from parents are incredibly valuable to me as a member of the committee from, from everyone. And, and uh, I, I find it's always a challenge to understand and appreciate the realities on the ground in, in the classroom and for the students when you have 4,200 students and, and so many different situations. So it's really valuable what you're sharing with us. I, to me, it points to, to <coughs> two things that I would highlight that the bottom line for me is that the current way that we have chosen to prioritize kindergarten admission is not cost free. Mm -hmm. There is a cost and there are three costs that we're paying right now as a community. Parents are paying the cost for full day. We've talked about that. Parents and students are paying the cost of the uncertainty that was just highlighted. They don't know, to, to the points the last two speakers have made, we have no idea whether it's going to be integrated or full day when your next child enters kindergarten. We know next year, but that's all we can figure out one year at a time. 
That uncertainty has a cost. The switching costs is huge for these kids. Mm -hmm. you, you put a child in a, a, a one environment that they have to adapt to for their first time perhaps in school, and then you switch them to another school when they start first grade. That's a cost. For some families, you have sibling pairs that are separated right now where the half-day student has to go to one school and it's not what they were looking forward to as a, as a child and anticipating my older sibling and I see myself as following in that person's shoes and now I don't get to do that. That that's, can be traumatic for a lot of kids. Um, so I, I, I mean, while I see the benefit of you know, guaranteeing as we do now that if you, if you wanna sign up for full day, you'll get it, we're paying a heavy price for that. It's not free. Mm -hmm. It's not free for the kids. It's not free for the parents. So I, I really think, I, I don't, there's no answer, but it's not cost free. And we talk in glowing terms in some of our discussions as if this is the, this is the great thing. And it is a good thing that all, all kids, parents who request full day get it. That's good, but it is not cost free. Thanks. Can I thank you for saying that? <laughs> thank, well, thank you okay. for, because you're the one I, I should be I thanking. Do, I do appreciate that being pointed out because cost isn't only money right. and yes there is a tuition-based program and I get how that talks like I get how it helps fund the schools I, I totally understand that but it's a public school so by paying my property taxes I'm also contributing I'm not a non-paying member right. of, of the community it's so to me the cost of this decision to my family and to my kindergarten it means something Absolutely. And I do think here in these decisions the past couple of years, the financial has spoken a lot louder. And I, I think that's uncomfortable for a lot of the people in the community who maybe aren't in the same positions to afford those things. So I just want to say it's, it is, it's the space. I, I don't, this, I do not, I understand how that is and how it looks and it's tuition based, but it's, it, it's two things that are driving that. It's the the desire to bring full day to everyone and every child that would want it, and the space. And it's not it's not a desire to increase the revenue or the offset. It's a desire to provide that education in that manner, and then not having always the space. So, I I I think it's um, I appreciate it. I know Dr. Doxer has a comment, and then um, if there's no one else who wants to speak who hasn't already spoken, I do want to move it along because we have a few more items on our agenda. But I want to thank you. Thank you. Dr. Doxer? Um, first, I just want to say thank you for being involved because I have to say that when my kids were in elementary school, um, going into kindergarten, I had no idea what was happening with the entire district and all of the the caveats about the education. I was so caught up in just trying to keep up with my kids in my life that I couldn't have stepped into this world. So I really, the passion that's driving you here, I really respect that and I appreciate what you're feeling. Um, what I'm about to say might feel like I don't understand, but I do. Um, I've actually disagreed about our taxes paying for neighborhood schools, our taxes pay for the best education that we can provide. And that's not always in a designated K through five neighborhood school. In lots of other communities, they've shuffled it around. So it's K through two or, you know, yeah. there are different yeah. organizations. And so. I, I think that that's, the elementary study is something that will that will come into. Is that a, a different, you know, I believe that has to be evaluated for this community. Yeah. So, but I don't want to, I, I don't want, people will take that now and walk away from that and go, oh my gosh, you know, now we're going to no, do. No, I'm not so saying so that that's I, what we're doing. The, the, that study is going to step us through as a community. We're going to have to look at all options, mm -hmm. but. I just want, so on that note, I think the only reason that's so hard to stomach for some of us with the older kids is that before all these space issues became so prevalent, at my kindergarten orientation for my third grader, it was a flat out guarantee that your second child, third child, fourth child would follow your previous children. So that's, I think where some of the 
the frustration comes from for those of us with older kids is that it used to be a, f a black and white yes this is your school once you have a sibling you know and I get it's changed now but I think that's part of why it's hard to swallow for a lot of us because mm -hmm. it did used to be just yeah you you got it once you're in you're in you know and now that's been uprooted so thank you I'm, I'm just going to be blunt on this one, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, but it bothers me that people can pay it like up to you know, maybe a thousand bucks a month for a house they already own in taxes, and they chose the location of their house perhaps in part because of its proximity to a school. The law says they're entitled to go to half day kindergarten in that district, not at that school, but in that district, and then they can't go to half-day kindergarten in that school where they bought their house. That bothers me. So if, you know, that's, I, my view is you should be able to go to your local neighborhood school for half-day, and if we have to cap the number of full-day spots, then people that want to use the remaining half-day spots can do so. But I just, I, I see it differently. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Barty. Appreciate it. I'm going to, um, move us on. We have a town meeting warrant article that we do need to address and then take a vote on. Thank you. As we discussed during the budget process, we are constantly looking at our renewals and if there are opportunities for us to obtain better pricing if we were to extend the renewal terms. As a quick reminder, we're limited yes. by master. Wait, so hold on. Um, oh, yeah, it's on the back of the enrollment the back chart. The enrollment chart. Uh, it was a little Monday. tricky because these are double sided. <laughs> so, sorry. Okay, now we got everybody on the page. So, as some of the, one of the questions we did receive during the budget process is if we ever look for opportunities in which to extend our renewals past the three years. As a quick reminder, we are limited by law that we can only enter into a maximum of a three-year contract or term. But we are constantly looking, as we know renewals are coming up, if there might be an opportunity for us to obtain better pricing if we were to extend the term of the agreement. We did this last year with the digital curriculum. We've actually been working our IT department in the town IT department. Our technology backup systems are up for renewal in the coming year, so we budgeted an amount next year for the renewal. We also know within the next several years we most likely will have to upgrade those systems. So we have been reaching out to obtain some preliminary pricing to see what the cost differential might be if we were to go with a five-year versus a three-year or a six-year versus a three-year. And at first blush, again, we would have to go through the entire procurement process. It does appear as if we would be able to obtain better pricing if we were to be able to go with a longer term. And again, this is both the town and the schools. Our backup systems are up for renewal at the same time. So working with the town manager, we are proposing to go to town meeting to obtain approval specifically for the technology backup systems. Again, we cannot do a blanket every single renewal. You have to be, we want to be fair to the community as well to say these are the specific items we're going to go beyond the three year with. So we are looking to have town meeting approve the ability for us working with the town to enter into an agreement exceeding three years, not to exceed six years for the technology backup system. So we wanted to bring that forward to school committee. And, and it has a total value not to exceed 25,000, is it, that? No, the, if it exceeds 25,000, the town manager would have to approve it. And that's in accordance with the procurement process for oh, the okay. town. We would still be able to go through the process, but anything over specific dollar amounts required oh, I see. approval. Okay, Ms. Robinson. So. I, I have a question on the we talked about this one of the budget nights or I think I asked that and maybe that's what your response I mentioned why don't we get town meeting to give us a blanket and I understand that because of transparency and all maybe that's maybe not a good request but if we're gonna go for I mean have we 
done a good inventory of anything else that we'd like to get on to more than three years so that we can put it into the same article? Because it sounds like that's what you were trying to do, right? Yes. Uh, we have gone through the majority of ours. Again, not to say that other items would not come up, but this is really for more of the significant renewals, the backup system, the renewal itself. Um, currently for one year is about $40,000, so that's a pretty significant item when we looked to say if we were to go to a five-year or a six-year, we were very surprised to see that, that it may only cost us an additional $5,000 or more to add three years to the renewal process. A lot of our others are very small renewals in and of themselves that you would not get the savings by going to a multiple year one so we have been looking at it as we've been going yeah, through I mean it. as long as you're comfortable with with and we've done a good good inventory of what's mm -hmm. coming up then we have this is definitely the most significant we've looked at the other piece of the backup is the battery backup piece and the renewal of that one in and of itself is only a couple of thousand dollars a year so to do a multiple one you may save a couple of hundred dollars you wouldn't be saving significant amount so we we have been attempting to do a very good inventory I will say as we are completing our capital projects that is another item we're looking at to say what is the technology capital projects we're doing what is their useful life and what would make the most sense so we are doing it very strategically looking at the item but this is actually was in response to one of the Robinson questions that came up yeah can I, um, I just want to say that we, we do have a motion, and because this is, um, this basically says that somewhere I just read that this is a draft summary and a draft of the art of Article 14, I'm going to ask the motion that we put before the board is a more specific one, which says to approve the request to allow the superintendent or designee to approve, rather than just the Article 14, just be, since it's not finalized. Correct. These, um, Again, we've been working very closely with the town, but the town meeting warrant itself has not been right. closed out yet, so it's yeah. still I just going want to through. let the committee yeah. know that, and I can, if I want, I'd like to have Dr. Doxer read that, then we can have a little bit more discussion. Can you do the motion? So I'd move to approve the request to allow the superintendent or designee to enter into contracts for technology backup systems for a term in excess of three years, but not to exceed six. and then it's more discussion. Ms. Gordon. Yeah, so Gail, how, <coughs> what if we don't like the contract after three years? What if it's a six-year contract and it stinks, right? So the nice thing about three-year contracts is they end at three years. They don't end at six. So is, is there any way we can add to this some authorization but contingent on the ability to voluntarily terminate the contract that after three years? That would be part of the contract negotiation. So the way the state contracts work is you have you, the ability to put wording in there if, if, if it's for There's cause. There's performance You wouldn't objectives. just be able to say, I don't like you anymore. I want to get out of the contract. There's protections for both sides. But we work very closely with the town to make sure if there's they're not meeting performance, if they're not meeting the expectations as we described them that we would be able to terminate the contract. Mm -hmm. There is that ability, but it would have to be for cause. Cause, it w you wouldn't be able to, because we also would not want the vendor to be able to do the same to us to say, mm -hmm. we don't see growth, we're gonna right. terminate on you. So th that is part of the process we go through with the terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. What about the pricing? Is that locked in for all six years? It would be locked in as part of it, which is how you're able to get the better pricing because you're guaranteeing them, whereas if you go out every two years. So it's not like we'll give you the first three years and we'll see. It's not one of those kind of contracts. Well, it's like the, the custodial contract where it goes way up at the end like a hockey stick. <laughs> Careful, Joe's again. in the room. Well, I'm all for it. Joe's waiting for us to finish. <laughs> <laughs> I poor Joe, Joe. I don't want to see contracts that have surprise. We're fine if we all know what's going to cost. But remember, but I don't the custodial outsourced contract was because there were pieces of it that were renegotiated midterm to save money due to the budget. Oh, right. Cuts. right. So okay. that was a different right. set of okay. circumstances Good for point. that one. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor? 
Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Um, Thanks, Gil. We have a uh, seam collaborative agreement that we need to vote on. And Dr. Darty, I believe you're to take us through that. Sure. So the bulk of your packet is actually collaborative material, the information material. Uh, by law, we have to provide for you the annual reports for the SEAM and North Shore Education Collaboratives. So that, what you see here is the SEAM annual report um, <coughs> for, your, for your information. The North Shore one, I don't believe is in here. I think that's coming up uh, soon, so we'll get that to you as well. But the, the motion that you're gonna vote on um, is by, by statute, when there is ever a change made to the collaborative agreement, um, each school committee has to vote on the change. So you did vote for the collaborative agreement, I believe it was two years ago. Um, we now have a change in the collaborative agreement. One has been created by a change in state law, uh, and one is because we are accepting a new member in the same collaborative. So the change in the state law is that uh, in the old uh, law, uh, DESE was actually a appointed representative that had a vote on the board. Um, they quickly realized that that wasn't actually logistically feasible because they didn't have enough people that would go to these. And then you had some ethics issues as well because um, these would have to be volunteers. They couldn't get paid. So um, legislature changed that law um, to say that now DESE is a liaison to each collaborative and not a voting board member. So that's the first change that we had to make in the collaborative agreement. The second one is that North Andover petitioned and the board has accepted North Andover um, to be a member. The advantages of having members, um, it, you, you want to balance. You want, you want to make sure you have a balance of members and non-members. If you bring in a member, they have to have a value add to the collaborative. North Andover um, basically is presenting to us that they can provide space down the road for programs, which collaboratives are always looking for, especially SEAM, because SEAM rents all their space. They do not own buildings, mm -hmm. uh, like North Shore, which does actually own all of right. their buildings. Um, the other thing is, is that the ratio of students that North Andover sends to SEAM um, actually would not be a financial liability to seem by them becoming members, because members actually have uh, pay a lower tuition than non-members. So uh, looking at those factors, uh, and the fact that North Andover is um, next to, uh, a, 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 a close to other SEAM member districts, um, the board decided to accept North Andover into the, uh, into the collaborative, so now each school committee would have to vote to accept these two changes to the collaborative. And then if you do vote to approve, then Elaine would be signing uh, a document this evening that would indicate that. Did you read the motion yet? I'm gonna have Dr. Oxford read the motion. Um, move to approve the amended SEAM collaborative agreement. Second. Are there any questions? All those in favor? Motion carries. Um, we have two other agenda items, which are first readings of policies. I've gotten some feedback that it's pretty late, and it's very late, actually, um, and suggestion that we table until our March 28th meeting, which would have been the second reading, but then it would be the first reading. So. Uh, I don't think you're gonna be able to table it until March 28th. The March 28th agenda has a lot of time sensitive issues on it. Can I? Yeah. I, yeah, I was probably not going to vote for these tonight and not out of disrespect. And let me, it's, let me say my point. It's I not think, a vote, though. well, a vote for the reading. Uh, I think that, you know, and again, there's no disrespect and there's no value judgment on anything in the, in the policies. The, the three, important things that this committee does is policy, hire a superintendent and approve a budget. I think that with uh, you know a potential 50% change in this, 
committee i think we should wait to talk about policy after the election that's just and it's not any disrespect to the chair or i just think that's the appropriate thing to do when when with policy i don't think we should be talking about policy right before an election and it's not a value judgment on anything that is in the policy or any of the emails or anything it's just just a philosophy i have we starting it starting this discussion at 10 20 is not going to be i think a prudent or smart thing to do so i would just say i i i hear dr darty what you're saying i heard what chuck just mentioned but we would i, I we need to reschedule it this is why policy is a hard hard thing to do um i would just um I would just say that I'm, I've been exhausted over the last couple of days. And I think that if people would just come talk to us and ask us questions, uh, it wouldn't quite be so exhausting. But I do want to let people know that um, there, was not, no, there was no intention to change anything about, and, it, and the policy would not have done that, how the minutes get published and access to the community. And, I'm not sure where that assumption developed, but um, so it's too much of a discussion to start at 1020. So I, I, I guess we're just not going to address, I'm not going to bring those items forward. I'm frankly without, I'd have to look at my Robert's rules to say, but I just, we didn't, we didn't start the agenda items. We're just going to move them to a future meeting. Mr. Gordon. Yeah, I would, I would agree that you know having having a, I, I would to mr. Robinson's point I, I think that's a good point um, I would just add that um, moving the first reading to next meeting makes a lot of sense because then you'll have um, presumably if uh, a full six people and different perspectives on the board to comment on the public record we'll have an election um, as I publicly announced I am not running again so my seat will be occupied the current seat I'm currently in it's not my seat the seat I'm currently in will be occupied by somebody else yeah. Uh, there will be somebody else in the two-year seat, so you'll have a different committee to vote on the policy. But I, I like the idea of having all six views heard mm -hmm. uh, in the first reading, and then having a different committee do the voting. I'm fine with that. I, and you know, the reason these policies, it just takes a long time to do this work. It and does. This, these two policies are things that there's been dialogue about for a little while. So we'll we'll take it off the agenda for tonight. It's just too late to get started, and we'll just see. I think I think you do have to vote to table it. Yep. I'll make a motion to. I think vote. you have to vote to table it. Because it's on. Because it's on. Just to table it. Because you table the agenda item. Yeah, I think you have to vote to table the agenda item. So I'll make a motion to table agenda items three and four, part G, uh, first reading of the BEDG and CBI uh, <coughs> policies uh, until next week. Second. Uh, next Second. meeting. I'm sorry, March 20th meeting. Until the March 28th meeting. Point of order. I, I think we have to just. John was, well. You can do whatever you want. You have to do it, at the very least, you have to vote to table it. Well, if we, then we, if we have to table it again, we do, but let's, I'll we'll accept that to the March 28th meeting. Did you, was that seconded? Is, I seconded. Ms. Ms. Browski. Uh, just a point of order that I, f or a friendly amendment not to say March 28th, because if there's not going to be room that day, I, then we're pigeonholing it into a, a meeting that we don't have time to discuss it. I would disagree. That's not friendly to me, so we can vote on that amendment if you like. It, it could be moved again, and I, I, miss, I understand Mr. Robinson's point. I understand Mr. Boyden's point, and I would just we'll make that decision. I'd like to put it on for the 28th if it doesn't, if, it, if I just, if Dr. Darty and I meet, we go over this agenda again and, you know, I'm convinced that there's just no room for that, then we might not, then we might not put it on. But, um, so, Ms. Robinson. I, I, you know, respectfully dis disagree. I think that the, the same committee that debates it should be the committee that votes it. So, uh, I, I won't vote for the 28th if we're setting a date. I think it should be done after the April election. And again, that's not a value judgment. I, you know, frankly, I didn't even read them that well because I wasn't planning on, on voting for them. So. Ms. Borowski. Can we have discussion for this late at night? But um, I think 
which I agree with Dr. Doxer. I wonder, and I appreciate it's not friendly, but I, I like the idea of saying, because they believe this for a future school committee meeting, and then let the chair and the superintendent look at the agenda and figure out, and, yeah. and contemplate some of the comments that have been made about should it be before or after an election. I think that gives some leeway for the chair to make a decision about what. Should we just vote on the amendment? Vote on the, um, vote oh, on the, the amendment. amendment as it is. Oh. No, no, vote on the amendment to the oh. motion. So I will propose an amendment yeah. to replace the phrase March, March 28th. 28th with to a future school committee yeah. meeting. Okay. Second. Second. All in favor of the amendment? Opposed. All opposed? Um, now okay. Can vote on the amended motion. On the amended motion, which is Still to. Still that's all. We're all friends. Mr. Boyvin, to table the um, first reading of both policies, number three and four, under new business, to a future meeting. I'll second that. That was Mr. B I was just sort of rephrasing. No, that's the amended version. The amended that's version. Yeah. So yeah. We're voting on the main motion. The main Correct. motion, as amended. All those in favor? Opposed? <laughs> <laughs> it does pass, 4-1. All right. I want to talk about it. I, uh, he wants it. It, it. it didn't say that it's not yet. I'm not going to be around. You can still come to meetings. Definitely I could. Yeah. <laughs> well, you still come. Oh, all right. Let's adjourn. Can I get a motion? <laughs> I'll second that after you make it. Second. Okay. There we go. Do we vote? Oh, sorry. <laughs> all those in favor. <laughs> that one was unanimous. <laughs>